if you don't have enough of these powerful medicines and food over your lifetime, your own biology doesn't work quite well. The environment that your body provides when that infection is inside you can shape how that infection behaves. Their immune response to the same condition was 50% higher than everyone else. I started using these principles on myself and started healing myself. I started using my practice and healing patients and I I was sort of shocked, like, wow, your rheumatoid arthritis went away when you did that, or your migraines went away, you've had, you know, three times a week for 20 years, or your irritable bowel, or diabetes just went away, or your memory got better if you had Alzheimer's. I'm like, what is going on here? And, and so I began to sort of really deeply dive into this, not because I was trying to, you know, write books or do anything, I just because I, I felt that there was this incredible secret of functional medicine that, you know, didn't, didn't fix everything, but it was such a better... Uh, way of, of addressing health and disease and that, that so many people were suffering needlessly, millions and millions needlessly, that were really uh, missing a very straightforward and easy solution for most part. So I, I feel like I just get so frustrated when I see people unnecessarily suffering. I mean, it, it, listen, it's a lot of suffering you can't do anything about. You, you know, my parents died last year or a couple of years ago, you know, COVID is causing great tragedy, you know, economic hardships. There's certain things we can't do anything about and are, are they're challenging, but uh, this is easy. I mean, I, within a few days, and you know this from your work, Prong, in, in a few days, people have health transformations, you know, like, they, yeah. it, it, like they, their diabetes can, you know, get better in a week if, um, if people are aggressive with their diet. So we see, we see radical transformations. We just, as traditional doctors, we don't really know about it. And that's really what's driven me for the last 35 years is this overwhelming drive to help tell the world about this incredible gift that we've learned about, which is how the body actually works rather than how it was taught to us in medical school. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you mentioned food is medicine and it's something you've been talking about for many years. It's mm. it's written within the, the brand new book as well. And I love I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I don't know if it's the same in the States or not, but there is a mm. growing number of doctors in the UK who are sort of rebelling against that and saying that, <laughs> and wow. saying that food is not medicine. And so what would you say to that? We're doctors. We do medicine. We don't do food, right? So yes, I get that. I mean, you know, we were trained to not just to ignore food, but to explicitly determine that it wasn't related to the the conditions that our patients were suffering from. We were taught that diet had nothing to do with autoimmune disease or cancer. I mean, maybe if you eat too much fat, you get heart disease or too much sugar, you get diabetes, but that was about it. So I think, I think we're, we're really uh, in this paradigm shift right now where, where science has allowed us to dive into what are the components in food and how do they interact with their biology in ways that we've never really understood. And it turns out, you know, we know that what's in food, right? It's protein, fat, fiber, carbohydrates, vitamins and minerals. And that's true, but that's not all that's in there. It's, uh, it's all this other stuff that turns out is really important. It may not be causing an acute deficiency disease like scurvy, but if you don't have enough of these powerful medicines and food over your lifetime, your own biology doesn't work quite well. And, and for example, you know, when you get grass fed animals, they're, they can forage on a hundred different plants and they eat this plant to get this phytochemical and this medicine, they eat this plant to get this nutrient. And over time, they, they really are able to modulate their health through a robust array of a wide variety of different plant foods. It turns out there's 25,000, 25,000 plus molecules in food that are medicines, these phytochemicals. And the Rockefeller Foundation is spending, I think, $200 million <laughs> trying to map out the periodic table of food, of phytochemicals and how they interact with their biology. And, and, the, and, and the concepts of these chemicals in our biology is really quite interesting. I, I call it symbiotic phytoadaptation, which is a big mouthful, but essentially it means that we've evolved symbiotically with these plants and have adapted our biology to use their compounds for our own benefit, which is, you know, we do this all the time. We, we, you know, we take a vitamin from vitamin C from an orange. We don't make vitamin C, so we use it for our benefit. Well, it turns out that, you know, if you want your detoxification system to work well, you need certain classes of compounds in broccoli family called glucosinolates and sulforaphanes. It turns out if you want to clean up your mitochondria and recycle all the old parts so you have healthy aging, you might need a compound that comes from pomegranate called urolithin A. Or maybe if you want to 
you know, regulate your gut and have a, a, a no no damage to the barrier and it can lead to autoimmune disease, heart disease, cancer, and you want to grow a bacteria called acromantia, that bug likes certain things like cranberry, pomegranate, and green tea. <laughs> or, or maybe, uh, you know, you have um, these zombie cells running around from your white blood cells that have been damaged from uh, various kinds of insults over the years. And, and they're causing aging. And maybe if you eat this, these phytochemicals, there's over 132 phytochemicals from this buckwheat that Jeffrey Bland has rediscovered uh, that are some are 100 times more potent than any other food source. And you eat these, it kills the zombie cells, these phytochemicals. So the question is, how do we begin to incorporate all these principles into upgrading our biology and, and healing disease? Yeah. I mean, just hearing all those powerful compounds that exist within foods... You know, it's mind blowing, really. I'm sure we're going to discover more. There's probably, probably plenty out there we don't even know yet. We don't even know the names, what they do, but, mm -hmm, but that time mm -hmm. is coming. But, you know, I think about this concept, food as medicine. And philosophically, I think in a culture where 80% of what we see is driven by our collective modern lifestyles, I kind of feel philosophically, as doctors, I feel unless we give it the same priority and call it medicine, it's yeah. not going to have that same impact, right? With our patients, so we prioritize the drugs and say, oh, we've got to yeah. give it that that weight. But then culturally, I feel, well, hold on a minute. Well, I grew up in an Asian family, in an Indian family, where we grow up with the concept of food as medicine. You know, if we're, if we're not doing so well or we've got a cold or something, our mum might give us more food with turmeric in. And, um, you know, with the South American cultures where they talk about the concepts of food as medicine. So I, I kind of find, I find there's a slight arrogance when we try and say food is not medicine. And it almost, there's almost this kind of um, attitude of, Oh, you know, we we now in Western medicine, we figured this out in 2021. We figured out actually that food <laughs> is not medicine. Okay, great. I'll go and tell my grandparents that and everyone else who's done all that research for years. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I kind of feel, I feel yeah, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty striking. Um, the, you know, the, um, there's a quote from R.D. Lang, who was a psychiatrist back in the 60s, he said, scientists can't see the way they see with their way of seeing. In other, in other words, paradigms are really hard to break when you're a doctor and you're saying, well, eat better and exercise more or eat less and exercise more. And it doesn't work. You go, well, well nutrition doesn't really work. <laughs> but that's not really helpful. As I was saying, why don't you just... Uh, fly to fly to London. Well, well, how do I fly there? Do I need a plane? Like, how do I get there? Do I swim? You know, like, and and what's what's really striking is that is that most doctors don't know how to apply food as medicine. So if if, if, if you have a headache, and I would say, well, I'm going to give you like one milligram of aspirin. You think it's going to work? <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like you need 600 milligrams of aspirin to get your headache to go away. So we said, well, I, you know, food didn't work. Uh, well, it didn't work because you didn't know the right medicine, which foods to use. You didn't know the dose. <laughs> you didn't know the frequency. You know, like it's really sophisticated. That's why the pecan diet isn't really like a fixed diet. It's really a set of principles that allows you to sort of eat in a way that meets your dietary preferences and cultural preferences, but also um, helps you to figure out which are the foods in each category that you should be eating that have the most medicine and what are the principles that we might want to learn about personalized nutrition or how to eat like a regenitarian, which we can talk about, or how to eat for your mood or longevity or how to feed your kids or how to eat in a way that's affordable. So it's a really practical guide. Uh, it's sort of one of those things you can kind of refer back to over and over again to yeah. just see exactly, you know, what's the, the, uh, digestible bit. It's a little, sort of like little snacks of information that allow you to really get the point and, and follow through on it. Um, there's a ton of theory I've written about before and the science, but this this is has a lot of science in it, but it's really a very, very practical book. Yeah. Uh, and on, on the book, I, I, I agree. It's it's a really good uh, digestible read for people who want to learn more about foods, the various properties and different foods and the various principles. And as you say, it's kind of it's called a vegan diet, but it's kind of not really a diet in the conventional no. term, right? It's that the way we think about diets. It's yeah. really not that, as you say, it's 21 foundational principles, which frankly are going to be helpful for so many of us. Yeah. I mean, that, that's sort of the joke of it all. That's like when we're in these different diet wars and diet camps, we're all fighting with each other. And I, that's how the this whole name came. I was sitting on a panel with a vegan cardiologist and a 
sort of a militant paleo doctor and they were fighting and I'm like, Hey, if you're paleo and you're vegan, I must be peeing and everybody cracked up. And I thought, okay, well, there's something here. And I went home and thought about it as I was flying home. And I was like, wait a minute, they're, they're identical. They're exactly the same principles, except for one, which is where you get your protein, which is animals or grains and beans. Otherwise, no dairy, no sugar, no processed food, whole foods, vegetables, good fats, you know, all the same principles, except, uh, except that one. And, and then the truth is they have far more in common with each other than the traditional American diet. And so I began to sort of realize, wait, wait, maybe we can all come together with, with a, a movement that actually helps to, you know, crystallize what we do know and, and then personalize it. And that's really the whole point of the vegan diet. Instead of an undiet, it says, wait a minute, if you're focusing on, I mean, the traditional American diet, yes, that's, that's an easy sort of win. Uh, but if, if you're, you know, keto or vegan, I mean, how do you be a healthy vegan? I see, I see people running into trouble with that all the time. And so, you know, I talk about how to do that in the book. So I think it's really uh, kind of a fun little... Uh, sort of kaleidoscope. And it's actually someone, someone, someone has said to me after, said, Dr. Hyman, there's no chapter on weight loss. And I said, that's right. I said, there's no chapter on weight loss because I never tell patients to lose weight. I just don't. I, I, I don't actually think it works. And I don't think it's helpful advice. And I think what I teach them is how their body works how to work with it. And the weight loss is automatic. I don't, I don't say star, starve yourself, restrict calories, and eat these foods, don't eat these foods. This is really what is going to help you thrive. And people just have the most amazing results. I mean, literally 100 pounds, 50 pounds, 75 pounds. It's really pretty amazing, but it's never, it was never a goal. And I, I, I think, uh, you know, it was sort of shocking to people that there's a book on diet with no, no, no mention of weight loss, <laughs> but <laughs> that's how it goes. Yeah, no, absolutely. So there are all these principles in the book. I want to sort of dive into some of them. Uh, and you mentioned eat like a regenitarian. And I think that would be, I think it would be a good place to go into. Um, let, before we do that though, Mark, can we just sort of set out the the foundations of the pegan diet? You know, uh, you, you sort of touched on a few of those principles. So for people who are coming to your work for the first time and are trying to understand, well, you know, what is the component, you know, is it paleo? Is it vegan? You know, what is it? What are these sort of foods that you're recommending? How would you sort of simplify the concept for them? Yeah, it's it's really pretty easy. I mean, it, it, I, it's embarrassingly easy, actually, because it's, it's like people aren't going to really be able to sort of disagree with anything because it's all pretty common sense and straightforward. So the first thing is, you know, really use your food as your pharmacy. So when you are eating, think of what you're eating as medicine. Are you eating a French fry that's fried in rancid oils that's, you know, got 14 different ingredients in it uh, that is going to kind of fry your arteries and, you know, cause all kinds of problems. Or are you going to eat, let's say, a wild blueberry and it has all sorts of phytochemicals and so forth. So how, how, do you, how do you begin to sort of think of food as your medicine? The second is you want to eat a lot of medicine. So eat the rainbow, which is essentially all the colors in plant foods are where all the benefits are. So the more deeper, darker colors and pigments, that's where all the phytochemicals are. And also think about your diet as mostly vegetable. <laughs> like it should be 75% non-starchy veggies, which is like, uh, really what the majority of your plate should be a little side of protein. Um, when you're picking any kind of category of food, whether it's beans or grains or nuts and seeds, um, it's important to understand which ones in each category are the best. For example, peanuts might have aflatoxin, which you want to stay away from or be careful where you source it. Or, you know, you probably don't want to eat a lot of the gluten in grains here, but if you're having heirloom grains like rye or maybe heirloom wheats, that might be okay because they're less inflammatory and so forth. Or maybe you have gluten issues and you shouldn't eat it at all. Um, or which beans are the best beans or which, which seeds are the best seeds and so forth. And then uh, I have a, a whole section there on, on you know, meat, which is, I think, a little shocking for people, but it's talking about how to eat your meat as medicine. Um, and, and some of the research on this is just stunning that, that, that these uh, grass-fed animals have high phytochemical contents, just like plants, and they have all these health benefits. So we're, we're learning more about it, but this is out of Duke. Um, so whether you're eating any kind of protein, how do you pick the best eggs or chicken? How do you how do you understand uh, what are the right fats to eat? How do you think about dairy, which is you know really a, often a big problem, and it's and the modern cows we have are pretty harmful. And then there's some you know just guidelines on how to eat in a way that's good for you, but not only good for you, but good for the planet and good for society. Like eat like a vegetarian, or you know think about. Uh, sugar is fine, but it's like a recreational drug. Or, you know, how do you uh, personalize your nutrition or detox or uh, eat for your gut or eat for longevity or mood or, or how do you afford what you're, what you're doing in a way that actually is, makes it doable because it doesn't have to be expensive. So it really guides people through 
a way of thinking about food that it, it will last them as a roadmap for their life. You mentioned meats there. You mentioned phytonutrients. So let's just <laughs> let's just start off explaining what phytonutrients are, and then I agree that 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 selection on meats is really fascinating. And you know, meat has become one of these controversial items as well. And one thing I do know, Mark, like myself, you're very respectful of people's individual choices, their ethics, and how they choose to live, and and their cultural beliefs. So. Yeah, just walk me through phytochemicals, but then also let's then go from that into meat and how meat potentially might be medicine for some people. Yeah, for sure. I mean, before we get down in the weeds, I just I just want to say that, you know, I, I my personal goal is to live healthy and vibrant to be 120 at least. So I, I don't want to eat a meat or anything else if it's going to hurt me. So I, I took the time to really dive into all the research. I locked myself away for a week with, you know, a stack of scientific papers, you know, four feet high. I went through it all, and these are the, I mean, there's 100,000 papers online on meat on the National Library of Medicine, but if you, if you find the major ones, you can find, you know, what does it say and what does it not say? And really, there were three issues. One was um, moral and ethical, um, and, and the other is in, in climate, environment, and the last is health. And so they're all kind of smushed together, right? So if you want to be saving the planet, if you want to be healthy, and you want to do the right thing morally and ethically, you should be a vegan. And that, and everybody should be a vegan because that kind of deals with all that. But unfortunately, it's not so simple. Um, and, and, and you know, kind of getting back to like what is meat uh, and, and phytochemicals, it, it, it also sort of speaks to the theme of the book, which is meat is not meat is not meat, right? If you're eating a feedlot cow, it's different than eating wild elk in terms of your health, the well-being of the animal, you know, the, the effect on the environment and climate. So people need to understand that quality matters in every aspect of what you're eating. And that's the whole premise of the vegan diet is how do you pick quality in each area? So in terms of meat, you know, most of the meat that's eaten and consumed and even that we have done research on is feedlot industrial meat, which is fed all kinds of weird garbage uh, <laughs> and is, is really full of, of uh, hormones, antibiotics, and it's mostly corn. But wild, wild or grass-finished animals uh, can forage on hundreds of different plants, each with medicinal properties. And those chemicals from the plants, these phytochemicals, we call them phytonutrients or phytochemicals, phyto means plant, they get absorbed and they, they start to become part of these animals' tissue and you eat them. You actually can get, for example, and for example, goat milk, if the goats are foraging on different shrubs, uh, you can have the same level of catechins, which is the powerful anti-cancer, antioxidant, detoxifying compound in green tea, as green tea. <laughs> so, so it's like drinking green tea when you're drinking goat's milk that's fed on certain bushes. That's just an example. But we're learning more and more about, about these powerful medicinal properties and, and how it affects your biology. And if you look at kangaroo meat versus feedlot meat, in a study in Australia, they found that when they eat the feedlot meat, same portion, they got inflammation. When they eat the kangaroo meat, their biology was totally different. They actually reduced the inflammation. So that's kind of striking to me when you see, you know, eating identical amounts of food, kangaroo, feedlot, profoundly different effects on biology. On that, Mark, in the, in the spirit of the book, which is, um, you know, pegan, bringing in, you know, paleo and vegan and where the, where the sort of similarities are. Yeah. And where do we all agree? I think one thing we can all agree on, no matter what side you sit on, on and the dietary wars potentially, is that factory farming is a bad thing. Would you agree with that? I mean, listen, you know, the, the, the moral ethical issues really have to do a lot around that. But, you know, factory farming is, is an abomination. It's bad for the cows and the animals that are raised in these confined animal feeding operations. It's bad for the environment. I mean, uh, just Tyson chicken alone is the second biggest polluter in the United States after U.S. steel, I think. <laughs> it's like, wow. And the health of the animals, this, the moral ethical issues, uh, and, and the health of the meat that it produces or lack thereof. So I think, you know, it's, it's sort of a triple whammy for, for the planet, for the animals, and for humans, and it should be banned. And there's no question about that. And I do, I do think that there's a evidence that uh, it's moving in this right direction, that there's a bill produced by, I think, um, a couple of senators who who put forth the idea that we should get rid, of, get rid of factory farming by 2040, which is now 20 years from now. So I, th I think we're, we're heading there. Um, but I think, yeah, it's an abomination and we should never eat factory farming. <laughs> so I think the other consideration around 
me eating animals is what is the effect on ecology and climate. And I think we know that factory farming is a huge contributor, that traditional farming and is, is probably the number one contributor to climate change when you add in deforestation, soil erosion, factory farming the animals, food waste, transportation, refrigeration, all of it end to end, probably half of all climate change. And and so the question is, you know, um, is it is it all animals that will do that? And I think that there's a whole movement of regenerative agriculture, which sort of focuses on a really simple idea, which is not the cow, it's the how, right? So <laughs> it's not it's not the fact that you're actually raising animals, it's how you're doing it. And the truth is that, that most of the land we, we now farm is used to grow food for animals, um, about 70%. And, and it is soy and corn, all the sort of stuff that we feed them that's highly uh, different than their normal diet, which is grass. And it creates all sorts of secondary problems, changes the quality of the meat and so forth. But the, but the way we grow these foods actually destroys the soil, uses up tons of water from irrigation, it causes and collapse of ecosystems and biodiversity because of the use of pesticides and herbicides. It, the nitrogen fertilizer runs off into the rivers and streams and oceans and kills hundreds of thousands of tons of fish every year. So we, we really have this sort of destructive agricultural system that that is often used to produce food for animals. And then that, that's just a bad idea because the way we grow it is the number one cause of climate change and how we do that. So I think we need to sort of change what's happening with the animals and put them back where they belong, which is on rangeland. And 40% of our land of agriculture says, so well, we should just grow vegetables. Well, you can't. 40% is, is not uh, suitable for growing crops. It's only suitable for grazing. So what do you do with that? Well, you have to put animals on it. Turns out that they will build soil, they'll conserve water, they'll, they'll reduce it or eliminate the need for pesticides, herbicides, <clears throat> and they will draw down carbon out of the atmosphere because the soil gets built. Uh, and produce better quality and, and even more scalable than, than traditional agriculture right now for, for animals. So we have this potential, and everybody's talking about it. There's movies like Kiss the Ground. There's books on it. There's, there's conversations that are happening in Washington, D.C. now about it. So I, th I think we're, we're on the precipice of a, re a real sea change around thinking about how we grow food in a way that's regenerative. And, and, and meat has got to be a key part of that. You can't have an ecosystem on a farm that actually builds soil without actually having... Uh, animals poop and pee and you know put their saliva on the grass which makes it grow it's like actually a growth factor for the grass so we want to keep building roots and building soil and, and that's really through the the kind of reuse of animals rotating through a farm ecosystem so I, th I think we have to sort of think about all these pieces now the last piece is health so um if people are <laughs> thinking oh well meat's going to kill me i don't want to eat it it causes heart disease and cancer pretty much you can go and find any study that you know, supports any belief that you have, and you can ignore all the rest. But when you look at the totality of the evidence, and you look at the kind of ways of what studies were done, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not convinced that meat is bad for you. In fact, you know, there are many larger views recently that, that sort of refuted that idea and, and looked at all the data. And when it turns out, when, when a lot of studies were done on meat, they were population studies, they looked at groups of people over time, they really can't prove cause and effect. They said, well, what did you eat for the last 30 years? Oh, you ate more meat than this guy? Okay, you had more heart attacks, it's probably the meat. But you can't prove that. It doesn't create proof, and, and it may be something else, right? When you look at the habits of the meat eaters in those studies, because this was done when we were told meat was bad, so if you ate meat, you you were basically, somebody probably didn't care about their health, right? So yeah. yes, it was true, you smoked more, drank more, ate less fruits and veggies, more processed food, more sugar, you know, didn't exercise, so of course, didn't take your vitamins, so of course you had more more disease. Was it the meat or was it all the other stuff? So, and then when they looked, like as I mentioned, when they looked at people who shopped at health food stores, um, who both were, were eating healthy food. Some ate meat in the context of a whole foods diet, others just didn't. And there was the same reduction in death in both groups by half. And when you look at cultures like the Maasai, you know, who live on milk and meat, they live very long, they have very healthy. But they also do something really interesting was they actually, it's not even necessarily how you how you raise the animals, it's maybe how you prepare the meat. If you're, for example, if you're cooking it on a high char grilling, that's probably not good. There's slow cooking with tons of spices. Those spices have phytochemicals that alter any kind of harmful reactions that can happen from cooking meat. So there's, there's a lot of uh, incredible science around how we actually can include meat as a healthful part of our diet. In fact, probably for most of us, we probably need to, uh, especially as we age, because it's very difficult to build muscle without adequate protein. Pretty much every chronic long-term health complaint or condition that we have, yeah. in many ways, 
the immune system plays a central role. And I don't think people realize that. No, no. Why do you think that might be? I mean, when I was an undergraduate and learning about the immune system, it was through the lens of infection protection. And that kind of is a historical thing you know, from maybe over a hundred years ago when the first kind of ties were made between these white blood cells and susceptibility to infection. And we've just always maintained this lens through which we look at the immune system as protecting us from infection. And then suddenly you start to dive into the field of immunology and you realize it's not just protecting us from infection, it's doing a whole array of other things. And I, I kind of, um, like to move away from that military analogy we often have about the immune system as going out to battle off the germs, because most of the time it's not doing that. Most of the time it's kind of like your housekeeper, you know, it's just taking care, it's working hard, it's it's learning from your environment inside and outside, and it's processing all that information, and it's maintaining the kind of status quo yeah. in your body. Yeah, I like that. I, th- I think a lot of us do think, um, still to this day, that oh, if I get cold symptoms in November, Mm -hmm. my immune system, in inverted commas, kicks in to fight it off. Exactly. But the immune system is constantly running. It's constantly working. Yeah. Right now, as we sit here, it's working hard. It's involved in so many processes, you know, like cells in your body have a finite lifespan. So eventually they die and they have to be disposed of and special immune cells are removing those and keeping things tidy. They're repairing damage when it happens, even if there's no infection. So last year I broke my arm, but I didn't rip the skin open. There was no infection getting in there, but there was still signs of my immune system working hard to to knit that all back together. So it's, it's sensing, it's a real kind of, uh, it's like a mobile brain. I think it's, it's very dynamic and it's listening integrating all these signals from our environment, from inside us, and then producing the appropriate response to kind of keep things in balance. Yeah. And what's fascinating for me is that, and I hope we get into this today, is that it's not something passive that we have no influence over. There Mm. is a lot that we can do, a lot of it quite simple stuff that can positively impact how our immune system works. Yes. And I know you've, you, you know, you, you, you basically done a fabulous job of summarizing it in your, in your book, Immunity, the Science of Staying Well, which is well worth a read, I think, for anyone who's interested mm-hmm. in learning more about the immune system and how they can use the lifestyle to help them. So mm-hmm. well done on such a great job. Thank you. Let's sort of dive in some. Should we, should we start with food? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's a good place to start. I put the food chapter at the end because I was really sick of seeing, you know, the whole immune boosting food supplement, whatever being pushed on, you know, the media, social media, everything. So I was kind of like, people are going to want to open a book about immunity and expect to see on like the first page, vitamin C does this to your immune cells. So take a vitamin C supplement or eat these vitamin C rich foods. And I kind of just wanted to emphasize it's not that simple, you know, and, and almost, um, make people look at the other aspects of lifestyle (laughs) first. (laughs) Before you dive into food, I I just want to, I, I, I love that you did that. <laughs> and, um, it's what I did in the Four Pillar Plan, my first mm-hmm. book. I thought I'm not, people are expecting this will start with food. I'm not going to start with yeah. food. I'm going to start with stress because I think that's what no one's thinking about. Yeah. But then I'm interested. So you did that in your book, but when the book came out yeah. and you started to write, you know, articles or a bit of yes. PR in newspaper columns. Yes. I bet you, or I'm going to guess, what were they wanting you to say oh, and definitely. write about? Yeah, it was all about, you know, my book came out in March, which was, you know, COVID pandemic, you know, going through the roof. So all of the press and publicity was, you know, how can we make ourselves invincible to COVID? What what supplements can we take to be invincible? <laughs> and I was <laughs> going to let everyone down and say, well, you know, nothing's <laughs> going to make you invincible. Because <laughs> from the dawn of time, we've always had this battle with, with germs, you know, like they're trying to infect us, we're trying to keep them out. We just cohabit this earth together. So there's always going to be infection. Yeah. And a pandemic's an unfortunate situation, but it's a very real one. Yeah. I mean, I'd love people just to sit with what you said there, which is we all cohabit this earth together, us mm-hmm. and the bugs. <laughs> you know, it's it's really quite profound that, mm-hmm. you know, it's not, I think humans, have, we've, we've often felt, I think particularly 
in the times that I've been around on, on, on planet mm-hmm. Earth that, you know, we kind of know best and we sort of, we can dominate everything around yeah. us. But I think we're learning, well, we Mother, don't Mother, Nature's, right. <laughs> pretty, Mother Nature's pretty powerful and they've yeah. been around a long, long time. And there's, yeah. there's a certain ebb and flow, there's a certain dynamic. Mm-hmm. We are not the only... Um, living species in the world. There's animals, yeah. there's bugs, and bugs, as no, no doubt we'll get into, yeah. bugs are not all bad. There's a lot of bugs. Yes, exactly. They're very I mean, good. 99% of them won't hurt us, and they're everywhere. They're, you know, right now as we're sitting here, there's there's bugs even in the air we breathe, and they're not, you know, causing us harm. Yeah. So most of them are good. But there's the obvious ones that come along and, um, you know, sideswipe you like um, SARS-CoV-2 has yeah. uh, as a sort of reminder, a stark reminder that, yeah, infection protection is really important. Yeah, and I, th- I, th- I think the, the thing I would sort of reiterate to people is what I think the last few months have highlighted for mm-hmm. us is that looking after your immune system mm-hmm. is really important. Yes. And I would say, I've said it's a lot in the press, like taking care of your immune system is for life. It's not just for, for COVID, you know, suddenly everybody's really interested in it. There's lots of marketing of immune boosting products, you know, all of the supermarkets and, and pharmacies were sold out of vitamin C supplements at the start of the lockdown. Um, but it's something that we should all have been thinking of before COVID because it's, it's, it's for the long game, you know, immunity is really entwined with how we age. So, yeah. you know, if you want to live a long and, and healthy life, we are as a population living much longer than the generations before us, but we're not necessarily living better. So if you want to, you know, I don't necessarily want to live forever, but I want to be able to enjoy my years and feel well and yeah. not be sort of burdened with chronic disease. And we can't bulletproof ourselves, but there's definitely things we can do now that, that are for the long game. And that, when I wrote the book, it was before we knew about um, the current coronavirus pandemic. So I was really hoping to try and get people thinking about the long game for their yeah. health. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, it, I'm sure in many ways, people, if they weren't going to take it seriously before, mm-hmm. are really going to now. So yeah. that would be our hope. So in terms of the things people can do, yeah, uh, if we if we sort of dive into diet and food then, exactly. um, what are some of the things that people can do to help their immune system? Yeah, well, I mean, there's the sort of ones that people often think about, which is vitamins and minerals. And we have a whole um, selection of essential, we call them micronutrients. So the vitamins and minerals that we need to function. And if you're deficient in any of those, you will impair your immune system. And I think that there's certain ones that are highlighted. So vitamin A, the B vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E. But you could sort of say that taking more than than you need if you're not deficient isn't going to make your immune system work better than it already does at its baseline. But the sort of subclinical deficiencies in our populations are not really clear. It's very hard to measure. You know, if somebody has an avert deficiency in vitamin D, you would see it clinically as rickets. But if they're subclinically deficient, that would sort of fly under the radar. Yeah. And being subclinically deficient is in one micronutrient is often a sign that there's other micronutrients that might not be quite at the right um, yeah. levels. And I, I, for people who, I just want to clarify for people that subclinical, so, you know, a lot of people are used to getting blood tests mm-hmm. and there's a normal range. Mm-hmm. Um, and often if you are with, you know, out with that normal range, you will be, it will said you are deficient. Yeah. Um, but we're learning more and more like B12, for example, is a, a prime example for me that the normal range is so big, Yeah, you know, it's something like, you know, 200 ish to 700 or 800, depending on what lab you're mm-hmm. in. But for some people who are at 250, although it's technically normal, mm-hmm. actually it, they're symptomatic with it, mm-hmm. Like they can have, um, you know, they can have all sorts of things, fatigue, they yeah. can have confusion, they can have muscle aches. And I really think medicine, I would say, has been quite black and white for Mm -hmm. a number of years. I think we need to evolve a little bit to go, there's optimal. Yeah. You know, there's normal, there's abnormal, but there's also optimal. Yeah. And and, and, and I think think that's just a really important concept for people to grasp. Yeah. And I, you know... um, 
if you're, if you know, have problems with any of these micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals, it's going to impact your immune system. So it's not so simple as saying, I'll take a vitamin C supplement and that's going to make me more invincible. So it doesn't quite work like that. Um, the other thing about the micronutrients is if we're low in any of those, it can actually increase oxidative stress in our body. So this is kind of the balance between oxidants and antioxidants. And what we've actually come to realize is this can affect how badly uh, an infection causes us symptoms. So if you're in a more oxidative state, so you're not, um, you, your imbalance of antioxidants to oxidants is out, that bug, if you, if you catch a, an infection like you know, coronavirus, for example, it can cause a much worse pathology in you. And it can also cause that virus to be under a greater pressure to mutate, to become more virulent. So let's, let's take a, a winter flu, for example, a winter flu type virus that we are exposed to. Are you saying then that the state of your immune system at that time mm -hmm. potentially can influence whether you actually get sick with that infection yeah. or whether you fight it off with no yeah. problem. And how sick you get and whether you, the environment that your body provides when that infection is inside you can shape how that um, infection behaves, how that virus might be under a more pressure to mutate or more likely to mutate because of the, the environment of your body, which so is really... Is this why you can have 10 people in the same room with the same person with, let's say, a uh, cold virus coughing all over mm -hmm. 10 of them, but not all 10 will get symptoms of the virus, will they? Yes, exactly. And we've known this for a really long time, but I think coronavirus and the current pandemic has really kind of put that under the microscope because people are like, why are some people getting really, really sick and others have no symptoms? And yeah. this is quite commonly seen with infections that we have this huge diversity of yeah. how we respond. Now, now, you mentioned oxidative stress and this balance between the oxidative stress and the antioxidants. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you, we could just make that super clear for people. So what is oxidative stress exactly? So we have um, oxidative, like things that are, are produced when uh, like byproducts of, of our cells normally working, um, things in our environment, various different things can, can cause that oxidative yeah. stress in our body. And then we have our own internal antioxidant systems. We have the micronutrients, vitamins and minerals that support production of antioxidants. And we also get antioxidants from food. And we kind of need this to be in balance. So we don't want to completely extinguish the oxidative side and we don't want to um, have too few antioxidants because they both play roles in different ways. And just being alive and functioning mm -hmm. and going around your day yeah. today is going to increase oxidative stress, isn't yeah. it? Because it's a normal, it's like all these things you want it, you, as you say, it's a balance. You mm -hmm. want that, but you want enough going on in your lifestyle to balance that out. Is, yes. that, is that what I we're saying? I think that's a, a good way to put it. And Oxidative stress is something that our immune cells do when they're fighting an infection because they want to make our body's environment very hostile to the infection. So they produce all these kind of um, reactive oxygen species like free radicals and stuff to try and fight off infections and make that environment hostile. And then you have the antioxidants that's going to quench that and bring things back to normal once you no longer need to be fighting the infection. So is this why it's a good idea to eat uh antioxidant rich foods because it helps yes, with this balance exactly and a lot of the minerals and vitamins in our diet are sort of cofactors in all of the processes that are involved in achieving this balance and then you have all the kind of phytonutrients so these are plant chemicals that are not considered in the recommended daily allowance like we we don't have a sort of reference amount that you should be taking uh, and has 20 odd thousand of them recorded so far so um they're kind of the the, the things that plants use as their own defense system because they cannot run away when an, a little um you know insect comes along and tries yeah. to bite it so they'll produce their own little chemicals phytochemicals that will try and um, make it hostile and when we eat these they help our own internal antioxidant systems and they also have their antioxidant properties themselves wow. so that's why we should focus on like a plant-rich diet and most of these phytonutrients are found in the pigments of different plants so something i do with my kids is that we talk about 
eating different colors and, you know, red fruits and vegetables. We have leafy greens, orange fruits and vegetables, um, yellow, then even like the browns and whites, like cauliflower yeah. and those kind of things. Um, and uh, the purples and the blacks, you know, the real uh, uh, that are found in berries and kind of trying to eat from a whole range of these foods rather than focusing on one particular phytonutrient like curcumin and turmeric. So that's one that we commonly see in the sort of wellness arena that people take um, supplements of yeah. this. And I think the, the uh, most uh, sort of basic thing that you should think about is that they work in concert like an orchestra so you don't want to isolate one particular phytonutrient or antioxidant and put it in a pill and take it because you might actually be removing some of its power because it's not being consumed in situ of all the other phytonutrients and um, parts of your diet that help with that digestion and absorption so I think food first, food first is what everyone should be thinking of when it comes to their immune system. Trying to get your nutrition from food so that you're not deficient in any of the micronutrients, which are the vitamins and minerals, and then getting all these phytonutrients, which are kind of like the icing on the cake to really um, nourish our immune system. And they have their own natural antioxidant properties. Some of them are antimicrobial, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, and they're often considered longevity compounds. So we know that we don't need a certain amount to be able to function, but we know that over the course of a lifetime, they're very important yeah. for longevity. So, I, I, you know, food first seems really simple. And if you have a chronic condition or some underlying health problem, then you might, that might not be an approach that works for you. But I think that is the best thing that we can sort of aim for. I think that's a nice approach. It's it's saying, look, there may be some value in some supplements at some time, depending on your mm -hmm. state of health, but let's get the basics right first. Yeah. Let's focus on food yeah. first. And it's the pattern of the, your diet. It's the consistency. It's not what you ate this morning, but what did you eat all week? What did you eat all month? You know, maybe you had a few meals that were not the best, but if the majority, if the pattern overall is is strong, then I think that's that's what you need to be looking at rather than getting stressed about every meal being perfect. Yeah, and that's a very empowering message, I think, for people because, you know, we are living in stressful times. People mm -hmm. do sometimes struggle with energy or motivation mm -hmm. to, you know, cook that perfect meal yeah. that they want to. But your approach is saying, look, that's okay, right? Don't beat yourself up. If, yeah. If now and again you have a meal that isn't, let's say, what you would ideally have, okay, fine. Yeah. Maybe enjoy it. You know, exactly. don't, don't feel guilty about it. Yes. But try to make most of your meals as much as possible. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, natural, minimally mm -hmm. processed foods. I would like. I think so. One of the one of the tips you're saying is colors. Focus on as many different colors. Yep. Exactly. Rather than maxing out on one color, yes. you're saying go for a variety. Go for a variety. And the other thing is, you know. Food, when you focus on food first, it's it's conveniently packaged up with other things that your body needs. And one of the key things that is often not linked to your immune system, but I'd say it's like massive for the, the resilience of your immune system is fiber. So pills and, and potions and whatever are not full of fiber, but the fresh produce is full of fiber. And people might be thinking, why is fiber important for your immune system? Because you're gut bugs, the microbiota at the interface of your digestion and the rest of your body are one of the key educators of the immune system. And again, this is something that's probably exploded in the field of, of immunology in yeah. the last 10, 15 years. If you do not, so if you take a, an experimental uh, animal model where the animals have a, a reduced or a minimal um, collection of good bacteria in their gut, their immune system doesn't develop and they're very impaired in how they can respond and heal. Um, and even things like, you know, protection from cancer because our immune system is the main cancer surveillance system. So these bugs are helping to educate and teach and mature our immune system. And this happens potentially in utero before we're born, but predominantly when we enter the world because we go from a relatively sterile there is some evidence that there may be yeah. some bugs in the placenta uh, but we go into this hugely germy world 
And suddenly our immune system has to cope with that because, you know, it, it's, um, it's got all these receptors on it to, to detect pathogens as being problematic. So it has to learn to tolerate those because, you know, most of the bugs around us are safe and harmless and we need them because they're helping us. And that's actually how the immune system develops, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is by exposure mm -hmm. to the environment around it, to exactly. the bugs around it, to sort of give it that sort of ongoing education yeah. so it starts to learn oh I respond to this I yeah. don't need to respond to that exactly um, I often say that you know the immune system's made it's not born there's maybe a percentage in the genetics that we inherit but then it's made it's built throughout our life and it changes throughout our life so that's a lovely idea it's yeah. made not born we can we can build and we can sort of develop it mm -hmm. the way we want to if we give it if the we, right yeah. inputs. inputs. Yeah. And I, I often think about the inputs as a way to shape the immune system. And I was trying, I was working on a talk the other day and I was trying to make a slide of all the inputs, some that we can control, some that we can't, that, that are shaping our immune system from birth. And then it just became a really busy, messy slide <laughs> because there was too much to put on there. But yeah, a, a lot of it happens in childhood. And in some ways I find that quite daunting as a mother and you think well you know there's the sort of first three years I would say is when you're being colonized by all these good bacteria and there's huge changes going on in the immune system during that time yeah. um, and there's this sort of interaction happening these bacteria they help protect the gut barrier to keep it very nice and, and tight and stop any bacteria going into the body because they're only good bacteria if they're in the right location. So they're not meant to cross over the gut and enter our body yeah. um, because then they, they become a problem. Um, but one of the biggest things that they're doing to help our immune system is they're, they're eating our food. And I often think your diet's only as good as your microbiota in your gut because yeah. they are, they're the interface. They're eating your food. They're helping you to produce these vitamins and minerals from your diet, but they're also producing these postbiotics. Um, and people might have heard of prebiotics and probiotics, but postbiotics are basically the metabolic waste of the bugs in your gut. So they're producing stuff that is their kind of, you know, waste product of eating your foods. Like short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids yeah. is the classic one. I, I used to work on these when I lived in Switzerland um, and looking at how they influence um, inflammation in the gut and beyond. So short chain fatty acids are kind of a metabolic byproduct of the, the bugs in your gut and they directly bind to uh, the immune cells at that site and they help educate them and teach them to sort of tolerate anything that you're throwing down your mouth because we're not supposed to um, react to that because it should be, you know, benign things that are going in there. But they have to help strike that balance that if you did get some kind of food poisoning, they also can identify the bad bugs. Yeah. So they help create an environment that's what we call tolerogenic. So it's encouraging um, tolerance of the food that you're eating. And there's a very kind of dynamic interaction between these bugs and the immune cells. And I'd say what happens in the gut is not just staying there. This um, influence, this sort of tolerogenic influence of yeah. things like short chain fatty acids is also being absorbed into your bloodstream and helping regulate the immune system at, at distal sites from well, the well, gut as well. It helps make T regulatory cells, yes, doesn't it? exactly. Which, as you said before, it's the, there was, I think, I mean, you mentioned the term peacekeeper. I think the first time I read that, I think it was in a nature paper in 2014, I think. Mm -hmm. I think I think I used that one of my slide decks. It's where it calls them our peacekeepers. Yeah. I think for the first time when I saw it in prints, yeah. um, which is kind of what they are, Yeah, really. And and I, I sort of, yeah, I mean, I, th I really think we, a lot of people talk about gut health these days, but... I don't think people understand the immune system that's linked to, you know, yes, they think the gut is yeah. something separate, but I, I often teach uh, doctors about this triad between our diet, our, um, uh, our gut bugs mm -hmm. and our immune system and how they all sort of cross talk. Oh, definitely. You know, there's yeah. there's bi-directional communication between, you know, diet and gut bugs, diet and immune system mm -hmm. and gut bugs and immune system together. Yes. It's like this. So, you, you know, if you, 
if you make certain dietary choices, you're going to improve mm -hmm. the health of your gut bugs, which is going to improve the health of your immune system. Yes, exactly. Just empowering, right? Because yep. we can do something about that. Yes. Exactly. And I think as a nation, we're not eating enough fiber. And also fiber in the UK has a really bad like image problem, I think. Like most people, I think- Come on, let's give us some PR. Yeah, give us, if, give I, it. <laughs> if I was to ask my husband what he thinks fiber is, and he, he's not in any kind of medical nutrition wellness field. He'd, um, in fact, the other day he came home with some crackers that said, he's like, look, they say they've got added fiber. <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> because we kind of think of it as being like, you know, Cardboard. Those bread, bread breakfast cereals like cardboard with the big fiber logo yeah. on it and um or fiber as being one thing yeah. but again it's the diversity different bugs need different forms of fiber and it, we find it in all the plant-based foods so it's not just the fruits and vegetables nuts and seeds legumes beans pulses and and whole grains yeah. and it's about trying to bring in the diversity i think in the last few years there's a, a publication about the sort of th trying to get 30 different plant-based foods yeah. into your diet because it's, per it's about per week. Yeah. Because it's about the diversity. But that also it's, that includes, I think lentils and mm -hmm. nuts, Yeah, uh, you know, it, you know, I, I think it's very achievable yeah. once people have it in their mind exactly, to, yeah. to do it. And they're very common in, in traditional diets. I remember growing up, you know, my mum would would add lots of different um, grains and beans and pulses to spin things out, as she put it, so that you yeah. could make a dish go a lot further. Yeah, wonderful advice. Um, so, so far, we've said that lots of different colors, lots mm -hmm. of different diversity of plants, is going to help your gut microbiome, it's going to mm -hmm. help your immune system. There was a study on, on doctor visits to over 700 patients with symptoms of the cold or flu. And they were they participated in, it was called a care study, consultation and relational empathy. And they secretly had to give the, the, the doctor a score between zero and 10 on the empathy that they showed for during that, that visit. And those who scored the doctor a perfect 10 out of 10, their immune response to the same condition was 50% higher than everyone else. And, just, it, and it just came down to empathy, yeah, how I mean, it made them feel. And what you're seeing is how, how you feel then is physically affecting your, the function of the immune system. I think that's the key, isn't it? That it's, it's not just in your head, it's changing things biologically, physiologically. Absolutely. And David, when I hear that, it reminds me of something that I often say, I've said it, you know, to the public before I've said it when I when I teach doctors, um, that the number one skill for any healthcare professional for me is their ability to connect. Absolutely. And then secondly to that, communicate with the person in front of them. For me, totally. that trumps knowledge yep. any day of the week. And I've just seen that time and time again. And that sort of fits in with what you're saying, right? That if- it's empathy. It's empathy. If you feel, as a human being, if you feel heard, if you feel listened- Absolutely. It, it does something, you know, A, you're more receptive to hearing what comes next. Mm. So I would say it's connection first, education second. Yeah. Because when you've connected with them and they feel heard by you, they're open to listening to what you have to say. Absolutely. Whereas if you just go charging in and say, look, you need to lose weight and get to the gym a bit more. You know what? You know, this is why a lot of people say, oh, doctor, patients don't do what we ask them to do. Yeah. Well, I think the reason they don't ask, they don't do what we ask them to do as a profession is because a lot of the time we're not communicating it in a way that makes sense to them and, and, and actually deeply connects with them. I know. And it's, it's that deep connection has tremendous physical effects. In, in fact, one of the, one of the, the side effects, I suppose, of feel that feeling connected or feeling good about it is affectionately known as the Mother Teresa effect. Uh, I think it was a study, I think it was at Yale or one of the other big American universities. They got a, over 100 people to watch a video, of a 50-minute video of Mother Teresa on the streets of Calcutta uh, demonstrating care and compassion to, uh, to homeless people. And at the end of the study their levels of a little immune antibody in the saliva called SIGA went up by about 50% for no reason other than just watching the video. And it stayed elevated for an hour or two afterwards. And that's because for the hour or two afterwards, they were still talking about, didn't, remember that part when Mother Teresa, she sat down beside that old, really elderly gent 
and they didn't say a word. She just sat beside him. She took his hand and laid her head against his shoulder just so that he wouldn't feel alone at that time. And just that emotional bonding experience of watching them on that video spiked the immune system. It just lifted that little antibody level. So, so it's not just the person who received that, it's also if you're watching Absolutely. that. Absolutely, it's watching it as well, because it comes down to how it makes you feel. If you can feel a sense of connection from being the person who, for, in this case, is delivering kindness or compassion, being on the receiving end or watching someone else, whether it's live or even on a video, it has more or less the same effect. Uh, and I guess, you know, that could be why... You know, if you watch a really good film that really moves you and connects you and you feel like crying or you feel like you're really Absolutely. connected with it. Yeah. I don't know, that's been studied, but I wouldn't it be... It has, actually. Has it? So it, there was a, a clip of, of Oprah Winfrey during the time of the Oprah show and she was... She, I, I forget the exact nature of the clip, but she was really changing people's lives and it was something to do with a school teacher in a class and what people watching it were moved to tears and felt so uplifted and it produced high levels of what I call the kindness hormone, oxytocin. It's also called the bonding hormone, the hugging, the cuddle chemical. But it produced high levels of that simply by feeling and moved and inspired by watching a, a, like a five-minute clip from, from what used to be the Oprah Winfrey yeah. show. Yeah, I mean, it's really incredible. And this is right up my street. Honestly, mm. this, is, um, this is becoming clearer and clearer to me as every year passes since I qualify for medical school. And I and I gain more experience and more experience to see more patients. This for me is the missing link in healthcare um, that not everything can be quantified with just blood results and test results and just, oh, do this, do that. There's just something deeper. Um, and and that, that is something that for me is what it means to be a human being because mm -hmm. whether we're a patient or you know we're, we're not a patient, we're, we're all humans. And there are some fundamental truths. For humans, mm. we're social beings. We like to be connected with others. Mm. What you said about secretory or SIGA is so interesting to me. Um, I, I've also studied immunology. And mm. for people wondering what SIGA is, um, you, we all know about the immune system, which helps you know fight off infections and viruses and bacteria and all kinds of things. And uh, a lot of your immune system, maybe 70% or so of the immune system activity is in and around your gut, uh, which is super interesting. Mm. Um, and that's called your mucosal immune system. And the primary, the, the main sort of defense molecule of that is SRGA, secretory RGA. So to, to think that that can go mm. up with this kind of Watching compassion. It, compassion being practiced. Yeah, it's yeah. incredible. Are there, there are studies, aren't there, about... Uh, recovering quicker from colds, I think, and the flu. When yeah. what was something to do with compassion? Yeah, I, the, I think that there's some research looking at the more compassion that, let's say, a, a doctor feels for it was part of this relational empathy study that the people who had scored the doctor the highest, in other words, the interpretation of that is they felt listened to, and they felt connected and more you know, warm and connected with, with the doctor, their recovery rate was about 50% faster than everyone else. It really just came down to how much empathy, how much of a connection was initiated by the doctor. I mean, that's incredible. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. They recovered 50% faster compared to people who, when, when there was no, or there wasn't enough contact and, and connection in the, in the, the, in, during the consultation. Yeah, I find, I find the idea that it's not just the giver, but the receiver or the watcher also gets a biochemical change. And um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with someone called Professor Francis McGlone. No. Uh, I interviewed him on the podcast about a year ago. Uh, he helped me actually write uh, the chapter on touch in my second book, ah. The Stress Solution. He's, he's one of the world's leading researchers in touch, basically. Oh, lovely. And he's done some incredible, you, you should check it out actually, because it's completely aligned mm. with a lot of the work that you do. Oh, cool. um, and he talks about, you know, these two different kinds of touch nerve fibers. You've got one, which is the fast one, which simply tells you where you've been touched. Mm. You know, you know if I yeah. touch you on your forearm, you know, you oh, feel it, yeah. wrong has just touched me on my forearm. But if you stroke someone on the forearm, it's, it does something completely different. Absolutely. It, and well, I, I mean, his his work has shown that it's a different kind of nerve fiber. It's called the the CT afferent that goes up to the a different part of the brain, the emotional brain. And when yeah. you when you get that stroked, 
oxytocin levels go up, mm. blood pressure goes down, Absolutely. heart rate goes down, yeah. natural killer cells, which are part of your immune system, go up, Amazing. I think, 50 to 70%. <laughs> yeah. So we're seeing a, a similarity, here, but also that most of those uh, C tactile afferent nerve fibers, so that that slower nerve fiber that tells, that gives you that nice warm, mm. cuddly feeling, mm. most of them are on your upper back and your shoulder. Is that right? Yeah. So what's fascinating about wow. that is, is that why would evolution put something like that on a very hard to access place? Well, his view and my view is that, well, it must have been there to promote that sort of social connection. So you would have to be with someone to stroke you there. Yeah. And so the touch giver, you know, gets just as many benefits as the touch receiver. People mm. who've got a uh, pet, you know, t stroking your pet makes you feel good, but it also makes your pet feel good. But mm. this is not just in your head, oh, it feels good, right? As you're showing, and as uh, Francis McGlone has shown, it changes things biochemically. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's fascinating. It's the same hormone, oxytocin. So, know. you know, I mean, what do you make of that? So, you, see, actually, you, you mentioned the animal thing. I, I love animals. I lost my dog a few years ago. He, he had bone cancer. He was only two years old as well. Uh, and so I started looking at the links between bonding with animals and oxytocin. And one of my favorite statistics uh, that I got out of that research is the chances of a second heart attack within 12 months and someone who's had one already, if they have a dog, is 400% less. And it's not just through the exercise, it's through a lot of it. Some of it is through the, the oxytocin generated through the bonding. Front page of science, you know, one of the top ranked science journals in the world, Front page, uh, about 10 years ago, picture of a yellow Labrador. And in the study, they compared people with a good relationship with dogs versus people with a not so good relationship. The way they quantified it is they videoed them and they watched them interacting with the dogs. And if someone made frequent eye contact and sustained the eye contact for a few seconds, they were called long gazers. So they were defined as good relationships. If they made eye contact less frequently and not quite as long, then they were called short gazers. So not as good relationships. So after 30 minutes of interacting, amazingly, oxytocin levels had increased by about 350% in the human and nearly doubled in the dog for doing Nothing other than warm, playful interactions, rubbing the tummy, just warm interactions. You get the same thing with humans. But it, the reason I mentioned it is because you mentioned dogs there, and I love animals. And, and, and amazingly, and that, I believe, is one of the main reasons, the main contributors outside of exercise to the cardiovascular benefits, because oxytocin has tremendous cardiovascular benefits. Well, well let's expand on that, because that is a novel concept for people that... Um, the sort of things you're talking about, uh, human touch, connection, mm. uh, stroking, you know, all, all these kind of, I guess, what we would call the softer yeah. components of health. You're saying alongside physical exercise, physical activity is the most important thing for your cardiovascular health. I don't think many people would be familiar yeah. with that as an idea. Yeah, just, just warmth and connection because they produce oxytocin. So you can you can create that sense through generosity and kindness, compassion, empathy, all of anything that generates that sense of warmth and connection, we, we know produces oxytocin. But what's interesting is all the research showing the physiological effects of, I call it the kindness hormone, really to distinguish between stress hormones, because physiologically in many ways, it, kindness is the opposite of stress in terms of how it makes you feel. I mean, if you ask anyone, what's the opposite of stress? Most people say, oh, it's peace or it's calm, but that's not technically the opposite of stress. That's the absence of stress. Physiologically speaking, if you look at the physical effects of stress and you look at the physical effects of the feeling that you get through kindness, which is warmth and connection, then they're physiologically opposite. Even psychologically, there's some studies showing that, you know, emotionally we get the opposite effects. Because many of this, the physical effects of stress are not because of a situation, but because of how you feel when you're in that situation. Because two people could be stuck in traffic and one person's feeling stressed and they're producing adrenaline and cortisol, the other person's feeling relaxed, they're not producing much at all. So it's not necessarily the traffic, it's how you feel. So if the feelings of stress generate stress hormones, but when you be kind and those feelings you get of warmth and connection, they generate 
oxytocin, I call this, the, I call it a kindness hormone, to make that distinction that it's a physical, it's a hormone that gets produced because of how you're feeling in that moment, which you initiate through empathy, compassion, touch, emotional warmth, any, any, any of these soft behaviours. And, and understanding this explains a, a large body of research that we knew the, the trend in the past, but we didn't know why it worked that way. If, for example, why people with better quality relationships have better cardiovascular systems, why things like hostility and aggression is correlated with higher levels of hardening of the arteries. We didn't know why that is, but now the evidence seems to suggest that, you know, aggression and hostility, for example, reduce levels of the kindness hormone oxytocin and therefore we, we take away a vital part of cardio protection because oxytocin is now, def, now called a cardio protective hormone meaning it protects the cardiovascular system one of the ways it does it is to, to reduce blood pressure so so I, I love explaining it in that sense that it's physically the opposite of stress because of how it makes you feel yeah. so you can feel that way through being the giver being the receiver or being the person who's watching a nice moment taking place yeah, David, my, my mind is blown. This is, um, yeah, this is so fascinating. So fascinating. And I'm drawing all kinds of connections in my head over things that I've been talking about for years, things I've noticed with patients. And this is filling in a few more gaps and it's all starting to knit together. Um, you know, you may have seen the study, I think it was published three or four years ago, which suggested that the feeling of being lonely is as harmful as smoking 15 Absolutely. cigarettes yeah. a day. Incredible. It's incredible. But then when you try and make the case that uh, oxytocin might be the cardioprotective hormone, then suddenly it's all starting to, to make sense. But I guess we have to we have to look at things on an evolutionary or through an evolutionary mm. lens, really, yeah. to try and figure this out right. Like I said, you know, why would evolution put these touch receptors on our back? Well, to promote social contact, you would think. It's nature rewarding you, saying, yes, more of this, please. I will make you healthy. Keep doing that. Yeah. yeah. In fact, you know, the, the, the gene for oxytocin, uh, the, the oxytocin receptor gene, actually, it's one of the oldest in the human genome. It's about 500 million years old and, and four days. No, I'm not four days. <laughs> yeah, it's five hundred, about five hundred. <laughs> crap joke. Apologies to the listeners. I couldn't resist it. But uh, but five hundred million years old. What that say that tells you is it's vital for the survival of all species. I mean, all, yeah. all warm-blooded species have an oxytocin or a oxytocin similar system. In humans, it's integrated itself during those hundreds of millions of years into almost all important, meaningful systems in the body. Even the growth of heart muscle cells in children. If children are loved and cared for, then as well as that producing human growth hormone, it also produces oxytocin, which helps to facilitate the growth of heart muscle cells, neurons, kidney cells, liver cells, skin cells. And that's why children who are deprived of love and affection, they, ha they end up, I guess psychologists, I think they call it psychosocial dwarfism, they end up a lot smaller than their genetic potential because levels of growth hormone and oxytocin are suppressed through the lack of love and compassion and yeah, care. Absolutely. And then there's the study with the Romanian orphanages Absolutely. where where kids, you know, were fed and watered, but they didn't get touch. Yeah. And the ones who didn't get any any touch have got higher incidences at older autoimmune problems, Absolutely. behavioral problems. Yeah. And it it all marries up that we're a social species. We are, you know, um we, we we've evolved to be connected to each other, but now we're frankly more connected to our devices <laughs> I know. than we are to other humans um so if you show your smartphone compassion and you touch your smartphone <laughs> uh does it also release oxytocin well do you know i i you made me think there i, I, I was i was joking but, no, but unless no, you're going to pull out a research no, study no i wasn't i was going to pull out the film <laughs> castaway with tom hanks okay and i, I you know remember it was it wilson he called that was it a coconut or a football he called it wilson I have not seen it, actually. All right, well, years ago, Castaway... But, but Gareth is videoing this in the background, he's nodding his head, yeah, furiously. So, so, so. so Tom Hanks, Castaway, he was on a desert island for years, and he made a connection. I'm sure it was an old burst football or a coconut or something, but he made it into something that he bonded about and he spoke to it as if it was a person. He gave it a face and hair and he called it Wilson. And he cared so much for it that one day when it got swept to sea, he was devastated. It was grief. It was loss. And I think... If you can bond even with, you know, make a joke of it, hugging a tree, it doesn't matter. If you can bond with 
even in that case, an inanimate object doesn't matter. It, it's as long as you feel I, I'm making light. Obviously, you're not going to bond with a smartphone, but in general, if you can, like a child bonding with a doll, for example, yeah. with a with a you know a teddy bear, it, something that you feel you can bond with. It's that bonding itself yeah. that releases the oxytocin. So we're wired to bond and to connect. Yeah, I, I love that, and you know the idea of a child with their teddy. Uh, or even this film, an inanimate object. Yeah. Um, and, and again, yeah, I, it, what started out as a slight joke, actually, if you think about it, well, technically you probably could bond with your smartphone if you gave it that kind of deep love, care and, and affection. But I guess we're not doing that, yeah. are we? And That's the, the idea, point. The idea of even saying that, most people will laugh at that because well, <laughs> we use our smartphones. But let's say you were to paint a wee smiley face on it uh, and and maybe something happened to you that, you know, the, the only thing you had was a smartphone and you just made a connect. Maybe that, that was your way of communicating with the world and you were all alone. All of a sudden you would have a connection with the smartphone that's different from just sitting on the tube and taking, yeah. looking at your emails. So, so it, I guess in some ways, well, in many ways, yes, we're talking about connection, but we're talking also about intentional living. And we're talking about being present and being mindful because that's really what that connection is, isn't it? If yeah. you're sort of um, building up that relationship with another person or another object or a teddy, you're intentionally doing it, maybe speaking to it before you Absolutely. go to bed. You're, and, and as you said before, it's about the feeling that changes inside you that actually leads to a lot of those biochemical changes. Absolutely, yeah. So it's, it's the, you know, I, I, I often suggest to people that, make kindness a practice practice thinking kind thoughts about people you know if you find yourself about to say something about someone stop for a minute and even just make an attempt you're not not going to do it all the time but some of the times make an attempt to think i wonder if that person's struggling in their life right now i know i'm talking about their behavior yesterday but i wonder if they're struggling right now you never know i wonder if that that man or woman is a good parent i wonder what their relationship was with their parents and just change the dialogue. And what that does, it introduces empathy and it introduces a different way of thinking and not always successful, but oftentimes it will make you feel a little bit more kind towards the person. I think if we develop little practices, then kindness becomes a habit so that it's the go-to, it's the first thought is the compassionate thought, the kind thought. And then the way in which you speak to people, the way in which you interact with people becomes gent more gentle and more warm because it becomes a habit. And that, I think, becomes your way. And I'm speaking from experience here because I, I have completely changed as a person in the and during the time that I've been really working on the mind-body connection, but particularly when I've been focused on kindness. I, mean, I wasn't not an, I wasn't a bad, I wasn't meaning a, as a horrible person, but relative, I have made large gains. Yeah. I guess in the I guess the quality of person that I, I've become, and I've become gentler, more compassionate, more kind. I cry a lot more. I don't know if that's related to it, but I, I'm much softer than I was maybe ten years ago, and it, and it's a consequence of my awareness yeah. of what kindness and compassion is and, and what it does for us. Yeah, you, you, you can cultivate this yeah. uh, as a feeling, as a practice. Um, and I think for many of us, we, we sort of feel that I'm just not a kind person or, you know, that's not me. And it almost feels a little bit forced, but I think you can force it a little bit and yeah. actually make it and, and, and turn it into your reality. And it's something, yeah. um, you know, it's something that I talk about on my kids loads is this idea of being kind. Mm. And um, we, we play this gratitude game every dinner time that I've, I've mentioned on this podcast before, so I don't need to mention the, the exact nature of that game again. Um, but sometimes we do add it on a question um, to say, well, what have I done today? What, what kind thing have I done today? Mm. And we go around and we have to think about it. And we, we, we once did that for about three weeks every day. Wow. And, and you know, I think... Initially, it was a bit tricky. It's, oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. You know, it, there was a bit of resistance to it. But after a while, it's really started to embed mm. in. And I think the kids were super excited to tell mummy and daddy yeah. at dinner time what kind thing they did today. And so it almost, 
I guess in, in some ways it's sort of playing back to what you were saying at the start, which we're going to explore is the power of our minds on our bodies. Mm. Like you can almost practice the kind of person you want to become and you can become it. Absolutely. I mean, it's like no one's ever become an Olympic champion by going to the gym once or running around the block once. It beca- it's a practice. So anything that you do to, to get better at is something that you practice. So I think when you practice being kind, that's an uh, amazing game that you play with the kids. Have you I, actually, in, out of interest, have you noticed that as they, you do that, you play that game, that they've become more likely to be kind because yeah. they're looking for something to talk about. 100%. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's very it? hard, to, you know, it's not a scientific study where I can peel out every little component in it, mm. but something has changed. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, for me, you know, I'd like to think I was a kind and compassionate person anyway, but I think being aware of this and actually positively trying to cultivate that on my children is also upskilling me in that area as well. Yeah. Um, and I notice that a lot in my interactions now on social media um, and that, you know, even when someone, which is very rare these days, but if someone's left a, a snarky comment or says something to attack me, um, you know, it doesn't really bother me anymore. And I look at it with kindness and compassion. I think, oh, mm. I wonder what's going on in your day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're probably taking that out on me. That's, you know, in my head. And, and yeah. I really, it's, you know, there's a scientific argument to it. But even if there wasn't, it just feels like the right thing to do. It does, yeah. And it feels nicer and you sleep better and you don't get agitated as much. Exactly. Um, I, I think that whole idea that, that the kindness is the opposite of stress is a, it's a really beautiful concept. Mm. Um, what happens when we get angry? Like, I mean, I know from a stress perspective in terms of the stress hormones, and I have seen um, anger that we hold on to mm. for years and resentment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is toxic. It yeah. can absolutely raise your blood pressure. And yeah. I've got a few patients of mine who I couldn't get their blood pressure down with medication, with uh, diets, with lifestyle changes in a way that I would always, you know, I would always go for nutrition mm. and lifestyle first until they started to let go of anger yeah. that they were holding on to. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that something you're familiar with? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's better to get it out than in. I mean, some of these people say, oh, you, you shouldn't be angry, but you need to get it out. There's got to be some way of venting. You know, I'm not advocating, you know, you know, being unkind to people. Uh, what, I, what I mean is if you... If you've got pent up and stored up anger, it's better out than it. In fact, I read a, a book recently called Expressive Writing by a professor called James Pennybaker, and he pioneered a lot of the work on releasing anger and trauma in the, in the body by simply spending 15 or 20 minutes a day writing continuously for that time on four consecutive days yeah. about your emotional trauma or something that happened. And you basically outline what happened, how you felt, how it's affected your life kind of thing, just some way, just want, that's a basic structure to vent. And sometimes you can swear and you could anger, out, but, but the idea, the act of expressing it gradually has an amazing effect. Because in one of the studies, they, they found that their immune response to an endotoxin was significantly higher than those who hadn't done the expressive writing. So the immune system was becoming more ro- robust okay. as a consequence of expressive writing. I mean, that's incredible. And uh, for people listening who are not familiar with what an endotoxin is, um, you know, one way of describing it is that inside your gut, um, we've got lots of different bacteria, you know, trillions of bacteria and, and other organisms. And, you know, we very simplistically um, consider them to be good and bad, which is far too simplistic. Um, but essentially, some of them, those those bacteria, are called what we call gram negative. And on their coat, you've got something called lipopolysaccharide or LPS. It's a little sugar um, that basically is fine if it stays in your gut. But if it sort of goes through from the gut into your bloodstream, that's where it can be pro-inflammatory, and that's cause all kinds of problems in mm. your brain and your joints with your blood sugar. So that's what an endotoxin is, um, and you know, what you're saying there about how it can alter your immune response is pretty Simply incredible. Simply just by doing expressive writing. Yeah. And they found a lot of other studies that they even tracked students over the course of a year and they tracked, they had enough students to get a, a statistically significant result and tracked the number of, of visits to the medical centre 
and they found that those who did the expressive writing had significantly lower need to visit the medical centre. Yeah, I mean, having just got anger and hurt and, and trauma out of their system. You've got to process it in some way. Yeah. And actually, this whole British characteristic of stiff upper lip, you know, keep it inside, I think it is incredibly problematic. Yeah. Because that anger, that energy really has to go somewhere. And we're seeing loads of good evidence now that it gets stored in your body and Absolutely. it can impact muscle tightness and all kinds of things totally. that people are trying to stretch out. Mm. But actually often it's um, unprocessed emotions yeah. that I've, I've seen in my own life. I've seen yeah. my own flexibility improve dramatically, yeah. not by stretching every day, but by releasing some emotions that I'd held on incredible. to, which is simply yeah. incredible. And, and, all, and you know, because if we don't, then you, you, it's possible to start fitting the cardiovascular st stats. I mean, one, one of the, I guess one of my favorite titles of a, of a study is called Marital Conflict Relations and Coronary Artery Calcification, <laughs> or CAC for short. Uh, and I think you can work, most people can work it with that. It means marital conflict relations and coronary artery calcification. Scientists took 150 married couples, put them in a room one couple at a time, asked them to discuss marital topics for, for half an hour. And they, they videotaped them and they scored displays you know, language and displays of, of kindness and compassion and gentleness and patience. And they also scored anger and hostility and aggression and, and all these kind of things like that. So you've got a whole spectrum from the real far out hostile, aggressive and, and uh, frequent expressions of anger to the other side, which was really people you could say were softer people, uh, gentler, much more compassion and kindness and empathy and touch also. And one of the most amazing symmetries I've ever come across in science, when I say a symmetry, you know, it's symmetrical one thing on the other. The group who had high levels of hostility, aggression and anger expressing, which you might say are hardened people, they had high levels of hardening of the arteries. And the other, the group who were softer people, they had normal, what you would call soft arteries. When you, t when you uh, controlled in the study for diet and exercise, smoking, drinking, etc., the only difference really was how you behaved in that half an hour. And that was yeah. taken as a proxy for normal behavior. That half an hour slice was taken as a proxy for this is probably how you are a large part of the time. Uh, and so what you can see there is if we don't get out of our system, it can end up having serious negative consequences. Sorry to interrupt. If you're enjoying this conversation, there's loads more like it on my channel. Please do press subscribe and hit that bell. Now, back to the conversation. How does physical activity play a role in the immune system? Yeah, well, um, uh, as I was actually doing the, the edits on the book, uh, you know, the lockdown had started and I, and I, and I, and I, I made sure that there was a, a section on respiratory tract infections, but, but the immune system is like every system of the body is affected by physical activity. And for the most part, just like everything else, it's, it's improved by physical activity. And, and we don't know exactly why, but I think it's because if you're, if you're in camp and doing nothing, you don't, and you don't leave, you don't encounter new pathogens, right? So I think there's a link between physical activity and immune function, because as you, being physical, physically active was, a, was the way in which we, 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 you know, we left camp and, and, and got exposed to pathogens. That might be a hypothesis. Uh, and it's also part of this sort of repair and maintenance mechanism. But, but there's plenty of data which shows that physical activity, moderate levels of physical activity, upregulate key components of the immune system. So for, for respiratory tract infections, for example, when you're physically active, you not only produce more uh, immune cells, like there's natural killer cells, which I love the name, right? You know, yeah. They're, they're naturally killing things in your body. They're, they're, they're your, they, they kill, for example, cells that come infected with viruses, right? Cytotoxic T cells, again, an important part of your immune system, upregulated by physical activity. And not only are you produce more of them, but there's compelling evidence that you redeploy them to vulnerable parts of your body. So yeah. when, you, when you go for a run, not only do you produce more of these cells, but you send them to the, the linings of your respiratory tract, which is, guess what, where we get, we're vulnerable to COVID, right? To this, to this SARS uh, coronavirus. In addition, uh, physical activity upregulates the humoral immune system, the antibody production. As people get older, their antibody production uh, declines, but people who are more physically active have much healthier responses to vaccines and produce more antibodies. And again, for the same reason. And so, uh, so by being physically inactive, we increase our vulnerability to 
directly increase our vulnerability to respiratory tract infections. But physical activity also has in indirect effects by making us more likely to be obese, to have metabolic syndrome, to have all the hypertensive, which are all the covariates that increase your risk to disease. So if we're gonna fight this, 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 this pandemic, one of the key ways to keep ourselves healthy is to stay physically active. Um, that said, there's interesting evidence and there's a big debate about whether too much activity yeah. makes, opens a window and makes you vulnerable. And there's, to be honest, there's not a lot of data because there's so few people who do too much that <laughs> we just don't have a lot of data at that end of the curve. Um, and it's still very debated. So within humans, there's not a lot of really good data, but in animal models, there certainly is. So there's, I, I cite in the book a study that is really quite an extraordinary study. They, they gave mice a really virulent form of influenza. And then for the few days where the, while the mice were coping with that influenza, you know, before the symptoms emerged, while their immune system was initially uh, dealing with it, some of the mice were, were sedentary. Some of the mice, they had them exercise like 20 minutes a day. And some of those poor little mice, they had them exercise like two hours a day. And the ones who exercised moderately had less than half the, the mortality rate of the sedentary mice. But the ones who exercised ridiculous amounts had much higher mortality rates than the sedentary yeah. mice. And to me, I think that, that highlights, I think, what every physician knows, which is that, you know, some is good, but be careful. Don't overdo it because you're going to deplete your body of energy. And that, then if there's less energy, than your, which in your immune system takes a lot of energy, you, you, you could potentially harm yourself. So, so, so really, as we deal with the physical problems, the me physical health, the mental health of this, this, this pandemic, but also just our, 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 our immune health, you know, yeah. staying physically active is just absolutely crucial right now. Yeah, thank you. That was a, was a really nice summary of, of the research there and, and sort of how it helps. So why is it when the data and the science is really clear that, as you say, 150 minutes of physical activity each week will have multiple benefits? Or, or let me rephrase that, uh, may have multiple benefits on your well-being and your longevity. Why do so many of us struggle to do that? Because it's, it's, it's abnormal. I mean, it's our instincts are constantly pulling us not to exercise. I mean, uh, our instincts are deep and they're powerful. I mean, for, for millions of years, our ancestors struggled to get enough energy to eat, right? They, every day they had to work. They didn't go crazy hard. You know, they didn't like work eight hours a day on their feet, you know, you know struggling to get enough food. They, they you know, average hunter-gatherers seem to work, you know, moderately hard for about two and a half hours a day, two and a quarter hours a day, of, of, you know, and then, then light, light tasks for the rest of the day. And they, they sit as much as we do around nine to 10 hours a day. But, but that, that gave them just enough food to survive. Um, you know, there, there are no obese hunter-gatherers, right? And, and if they were to go for, like what I did this morning, go for a, a long run just for the hell of it in the morning, um, they would then waste all that energy, which they could use towards reproduction and the things that natural selection cares about. So nobody in the Stone Age ever went for, for a morning run for the, for the fun of it. And it's, it's a bad idea. And, 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 and whenever you have a chance to save energy, you, you, you should uh, it, 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 until recently. And now we live in this really strange, interesting modern world, wonderful in all kinds of one in regards, where we can you know, spend our entire day without ever getting our heart rate up, you know, press buttons to get food and shopping carts. And, and, and you know, I don't even have to move my hand when I brush my teeth if I didn't want to. You know, I get an electric toothbrush, right? I mean, everything is mechan mechan mechanical. And, and, and the result is that we no longer have to be physically active and we now have to do something really weird, which is to, which is to choose to be physically active. Uh, and, and although we know up here, right, in our brains that it's good for us, all kinds of instincts just kick in to tell us not to. I think the best evidence for that are when you have like a stairway next to an escalator, right? You must see them, yeah. you know, they're in tube stops all over the place and then, you know, in airports everywhere. We all, we all know this phenomenon, right? And, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world. People have studied this in Japan and in Denmark and in America and in Israel and, you know, various places, wherever there is a stairway next to an escalator, less than 5% of people take the stairway. And if you put a wow. sign up, that just goes up just a wee bit, right? If you put a, escalators in the Kalahari Desert, you know, they would take the escalator there too. It's an instinct. Yeah, and, and I think what you just said there about the Kalahari Desert really, I think it brings it to life for people because a lot of people feel bad. They feel guilt. They, they feel shame that they're not moving as much as either 
their doctor has told them, the, the news has asked them to do, or even people they're following on social media who, you know, post the photo, hey, just in my uh, 10K uh, run before breakfast, how are you all doing today? You know, that kind of meme, which I think if you, if you find it inspiring and you're like, oh, well, man, I didn't do anything. I want to do that. Great. But for many people, they watch that and, and day in, day out, they're feeding their brains with that thinking, I'm some kind of failure. Like, look at all these people who can move their body every day and are vibrant and are full of energy. Yeah, just getting through the day is a real struggle. And I think that's one of the beautiful things in your book is that you, you help people not to feel bad about it. You're sort of arguing that we've not evolved to exercise. Absolutely. We didn't. Look, we also didn't evolve to go to school, right? I mean, uh, we didn't, you know, until recently, almost nobody read and nobody no, but of course, schools didn't exist, right? Yeah. I mean, there are so many things of our modern world that are good for us. I mean, no, no parent thinks that sending their kid to school is bad and they shouldn't you know, learn, that their kids shouldn't learn to read. But, but you know, that's also a modern abnormal thing. And, and think about how we get school to work, right? We make it compulsory, <laughs> but we also try to make it fun too, right? You know, we have recess and all kinds of, you know, you meet your friends there and we try to make school both fun and necessary. And I think we should treat Edu exercise the way we treat education it, because it's it's a modern abnormal thing but it's good for us and 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 we should we should make it necessary but we should also try to make it fun but the last thing we should do is make people feel bad about it because <clears throat> making people feel bad about about doing what's natural for them um, doesn't help anybody I think the same thing goes with dieting right yeah. I mean we never evolved to lose weight um, but we all a lot of people are trying to lose weight and for good reason but but when they fail on their diet, it's not because of some moral failing. It's because there are hundreds of adaptations in their bodies which want to hold on to that fat um, and, you know, and, 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 and elicit a, a kind of a <clears throat> fast, you know, a, an energetic crisis in their bodies to hold on to that energy. And it's not their fault that they're having a hard yeah. time losing weight. It's, it's the fault of their, their biology. And yet we, we then blame them and make them feel bad. And I think we need to understand that our bodies aren't, we don't just get to decide what we do with our bodies. Our bodies are evolved and uh, over millions and millions of generations. And we, and we need to be compassionate and understand that and work with our biology to find better solutions. I mean, yeah. what we've done with exercise is we've medicalized it. With, and I have nothing wrong with the medical profession. Obviously, uh, yeah, I almost became a, a physician myself. But most doctors' job is to treat people when they're sick, not to prevent them from getting sick. And that's part of the medical system as a whole. That's another issue. But, but the other thing we've done with, 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 with exercise is we've commercialized it, we've industrialized it, we've commodified it, uh, you know, we tell people to just do it, right? And, and again, there's nothing wrong with medicalizing exercise, there's nothing wrong with commercializing and industrializing exercise, but clearly it's not enough because like in the United States, I don't know what the data are in England, I've been trying to find good data in England, there's not as much, but, but in the United States, only 20% of Americans actually exercise in their leisure time. That's a really staggering number, right? Um, you know, there are people who are physically active, you know, um, but, but, but not many people actually get out and do it. And there's a reason for that. It's not because they're lazy or, or bad or, 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 or should feel guilty or ashamed. They're just being normal human beings. Yeah. You know, it, it, it really is wonderful to have someone with your pedigree. You're such an esteemed, highly respected researcher, professor, you're basically saying we need to be kind to ourselves. We need to be compassionate to ourselves. You're making the case with, you know, for physical activity and exercise that we need to be compassionate to ourselves. But I love what you said there about trying to lose weight. We've not evolved to lose weight. And what you just said, what you, what you just mentioned there is a sort of central case I've been writing about over the last few months for my next book, which is on weight loss. And I, I very much agree. We have to be kind and compassionate to ourselves and understand we're kind of fighting our biology, you know, the, the environment in which we live is very much re so removed from the environment in which we've evolved that therefore, you know, we're not doing anything necessarily wrong. We're just doing what humans have always done. Humans have always tried to make things easy, right? We've always looked for high calorie, energy dense foods to, to, you know, for as little energy as possible. It just so happens now that on my smartphone, I can go on a shopping app and have that delivered to my house without actually moving anywhere. So it, I think it really does help people feel better. I, I read an article with you, Daniel, recently that I think you wrote in the British press. 
And you said in it that you were the kid who never got picked for the sports team at school. Yet here we are with having a conversation and it's early your time. What is it? 7.30, quarter to eight? Uh, like no, it's that. 8.30. It's not that early. 8.30. Either. But yeah. you've already been for a run. And <clears throat> that made me think about what you've just said about we've got to make it fun for people. Uh, we've got to, you know, you, we made school compulsory, but we also try and make it fun. And you're sort of making a similar case for exercise. So is part of the problem also, like with you, and you've obviously overcome that and you are still uh, someone who moves regularly, but many people have that experience at school. They're not picked for the teams. They're made to feel uh, shame and bad about themselves that they can't be sporty like their friends who have been picked in the team. And that puts them off moving their bodies for life. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I was lucky because although I was terrible, in, I really was picked last for sports. I, I, I for example, played on a, on a soccer team. I get, you call it football. Um, and uh, in, in my town that I grew up in, there was a, it was a really good, good, good soccer town. And so there were kids on my team who were so much better than me. I just sat on the bench. You know, I almost never got to play because I wasn't very good. And, um, you know, I, I, I felt very insecure about my body. And, and, uh, but I was lucky that I had parents who loved to hike and loved to, we went skiing in the winter, cross country skiing. And my, my mother, you know, jogged and my father jogged too. And so they were physically active, but they didn't play sports. I don't think they ever watched any sports event ever. I don't think. Um, <laughs> I played tennis a bit, but you know, that was, um, you know, I had to walk to a tennis court. That was fine. But you know, they, they weren't interested in any of that. I don't think they ever came to any game I was ever in, partly because I sat on the bench, right? But um, um, uh, so I kind of grew up thinking it was sort of normal to be physically active, but not interested in sports. But so much of physical activity that kids encounter is sports. And sports, you know, there's a whole chapter in my book on sports. Sports can have exercise, but it doesn't always have exercise. And that exercise isn't always necessarily healthy. Look at American football. I mean, that's a really profoundly unhealthy sport. Uh, and we have more and more data uh, to show that, not just, not just in terms of concussions, but also in terms of heart disease and other kinds of problems that, that arise from, from, you know, bulking up, making these sort of sumo wrestler sized sort of linemen in the, in the, in the, in the sport. But, but we, you know, we, 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 we could do a better job of making it fun. I mean, some schools do that, um, but um, and making sure it's about fitness. I mean, m my university, Harvard, has a, you know, an, a, a huge athletics program. We have 40 teams, um, one of the largest athletic programs in the United States, even though this is not a powerhouse school in terms of athletics. But, um, um, but the, the, the athletics department really mostly serves the athletes on campus and they're, job isn't really that much to get the other 80% of students um, to, be, to be physically active. And, and, and surprise, surprise, the vast majority of Harvard students, about 75%, don't meet the minimum level of physical activity um, uh, that you would need in the United States. Um, and, and that's partly because we don't make it fun for them. You know, there's no opportunities for them. And probably most of them, and all of them would like to do more exercise, but they, they're busy and they're stressed and they've got courses and classes and they don't have to do it. And, and you know, we could do a much better job of helping them uh, be active. And they want us to do a better job of helping them be active. It's not something you can just snap your fingers and do on your own. It's an interesting dilemma, isn't it? That we, 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 we look up to these incredible athletes uh, with superhuman performances. You know, the American footballers, let's say, in the States, or, uh, you know, Elliot Kipchoge, the runner who can, you know, run a marathon, frankly, in a time that just makes me shudder even thinking about the fact that he can do that in under two hours. But there's a difference, isn't there? It's, what you're, it's the case you're sort of making that that's kind of elite performance it doesn't mean that's healthy. It doesn't mean that's what we should all be striving for. And, and I, I think why I find that interesting is because, have you heard of Park Run? Are you familiar yes, with Park Yes, of course. Run? Yeah, no, it's wonderful, Park Run. Fantastic. Yeah, but I mean, I'd love to talk about Park Run at, at some point because there are so many aspects there, community, um, you know, uh, the social aspect to moving together, whether it's run, walk, whether it's walk, whether it's running, um, but you also get timed at a park run. And I've often wondered, is timing it a good idea or not? Because loads of people who suffer with mental health problems, park run is actually 
what really, really helps them, that, that strong sense of community, you're moving, you're, even if you're a volunteer at that park run, you still get a lot of benefits. But I want to then, when the timing comes in, and I'm not against it, I'm just sort of posing the question, does that start to make us think about performance and taking us away from just doing it because it's a fun thing to do for some well, I, of us? Yeah. I mean, I think, I, think, I think we, you know, there's so many different motivations that people have, and I think we need to, we need to um, embrace them all, right? For some yeah. people, timing is great. It gives them a little impetus. It gets them, gets them, gives them, you know, a, a, you know, it helps them, you know, do a little better and, you know, challenge yeah. themselves. Other people find it defeating and, 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 and off-putting. And, and so I think, you know, we should let a thousand kinds of physical activity bloom, right? And if, and if, and if you, know, part, you know, there's never going to be one type, right? Yeah. For some people, why not just dancing? I mean, I, I have a section in the book on dancing. You do, is, and I've got that written <laughs> down to talk to you about because yeah. I didn't know that at all. So please yeah. do expand yeah. on that. It was a brilliant section. Yeah, I mean, every culture in the world, I can't find an, exam, an exception, has, has not only just dancing, but endurance dancing as part of its as part of its culture, you know, people, people dance for hours um, in just about every culture. And I even, even in Jane Austen, I found some wonderful quotes in, in Jane Austen and, you know, Georgian England where people, you know, dance the night away, right? Um, um, it's, it's, it's a way of making physical activity, and they probably didn't think of it as exercise, it was social, it was fun. So there are many, many ways for us to get our bodies moving and, to, and, and, to, and get the benefits, the, the mental health benefits, the physical health benefits. And I think we should, if we're going to be successful, we need to try to, you know, we, there's not, not going to be one size fits all approach, right? There's going to have to be many approaches. I mean, look, there are some people, I, you know, as, you, as you know, because you read the book, throughout the book, I make fun of treadmills. Because treadmills are, you know, for me, the apotheosis of exercise. Here's a machine, you know, you have to spend money to buy it or spend money to go to the gym to use it. It makes you work hard to basically stay in the same place. You get nothing done. It's loud. It's noisy. You know, it's, the air is fed it. I mean, I, you know, I, I put people on treadmills for a living, but I hate treadmills. I mean, I have one in my basement. I sometimes use it. So what some people do is they, they you know, they listen to a podcast or maybe, maybe this podcast or, or they'll watch a movie or, or, or whatever to tolerate the treadmill. And, you know, if that, if that works for them, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. If it's actually very efficient, you can do two things at once. You can listen to a podcast and get some fit exercise at the same time, but, but others just can't stand it. So let's, let's not be judgmental. It's any, any way that works is, is great. I mean, and we just have to support them all. I'm a big fan of individualized and personalized approaches. And I really like that idea that maybe we've got to broaden out what we recommend to people. Say, so, you know, it doesn't matter um, how you move your body, but you just want to move it more um, and find what actually works for you. But are there any sort of universal principles when it comes to movement that actually do work for all of us? In terms of getting us to move? I mean, I, again, I go back to the simple, I mean, my, my, you know, I think there's sort of, again, two basic impetuses that have, you know, over, over millennia have been the basis for how and why people move. And one is because it's necessary. And the other is because it's fun. And for most people, fun involves social. Um, um, so uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes going for a run by yourself or a walk by yourself is meditative and it's nice to be by yourself and you can think through a problem. But for most of us, you know, we like to be with other people. And so that's why Park Run is so successful. It's social. Here in Cambridge, we have the November project. Every Wednesday, people do these wonderful runs and they run up the stadium and they do all kinds of great stuff. Wow. We have, you know, all around the world, there are various kinds of, of, of social events. There are, you know, dancing is social. Um, uh, playing a game of, you know, soccer or football is social. I mean, the list goes on, right? Um, and, um, and there are many ways to do it socially. And I think, so, so that's critical. Um, but, but that's never going to be enough for some folks. And, 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 you know, exercise, physical activity used to be necessary in our lives. And that was the impetus that people had to get out and, and every day and, and do work. And so we need to find ways without coercing them un, un, unethically uh, to make exercise, to make physical activity necessary. And, and because it's not appropriate to tell adults that you can't, they can't have the benefits of society unless they exercise, right? Um, we, we need to help people help, help themselves. And I think the way to do that is through what's called a commitment contract. 
So let me go again back to education. In education, we have, education works on a commitment contract basis for adults, right? So I'm a professor in a university where people pay ghastly sums to go to Harvard, right? I mean, I think the tuition is, and, and, and room and board and all that costs like sixty to $70,000 a year. That's full, full. Of course, most students don't end up paying that. I mean, the vast majority get financial aid. So, so don't worry. Most of my students are not fabulously wealthy, actually. Many of them are first-generation students because we have, we're lucky we have really good financial aid. But anyway, somebody's paying sixty to $70,000 every year for them to go to school. And there's some commitment from them to go to school. And, and, and what are they doing? They're having people like me torture them, right? I make them take exams, I make them read books, I make them stay up late at night studying, and if they don't do well, I give them a bad grade, which, you know, which you know, stigmatizes them for the rest of their life. And, 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 um, but they do it willingly because, because they've signed a kind of a commitment contract, whereas, whereas they're paying money for me to make them do stuff which they know is good for them, which they otherwise wouldn't do for themselves. And we do all kinds of other commitment contracts in our, in our, in our world. And, and I think exercise is, should be part of that. We should, we should find exercise, you know, there are many, so there's a wonderful program called stick.com. It's a website run through uh, some economists. They used to be at Yale, I'm not sure if they're still at Yale, where you can basically pick either a stick, carrot or a stick, right? And, and I describe this in the book, because you, you yeah. there's a friend of mine in, in San Francisco who was, who's been trying to lose weight, and she uh, gave stick.com, I think $2,000. So not, an un, not a small amount of money. And every week she agreed that she was gonna walk a certain number of miles. And if she didn't get those number of miles in, and her husband was a referee, if she didn't do those miles as affirmed by her husband, they would automatically send $50 that week to the National Rifle Association. That's the big <laughs> association that tries to prevent uh, gun control laws in the United States. And she is very, very much hates the NRA and wants to see gun, gun. And she has never missed a week of her walking since she's been doing that. So she, she signed a commitment contract, put some money behind it. Now that's a kind of an extreme one, but there are other ways we can do it just with, through a friend. I mean, a lot of the, my early morning runs, I don't, you know, at 6 a.m., I do not want to run, I promise you. I mean, no, but I want to be in bed with my wife, right? But I often meet a friend of mine uh, who's a cardiologist and he's at 6 a.m. He doesn't want to be there either. But we kind of agreed the day before that we were going to meet each other at 6 a.m. Um, to go for a run. And uh, usually we're just like irritated at each other and we don't even speak for the first, you know, 10 minutes. Um, and then slowly we warm up. And I'm never unhappy that I did that run at the end. But I, I, I did it because I, I coerced myself through a commitment contract. Yeah. V very, very practical and pragmatic approach. I guess what you're saying is that the way we've typically encouraged physical activity has been you know very prescriptive you have to do this um you know if you don't do it you're not really looking after yourself you sort of have to rely we, we're very much putting it down to individual motivation individual willpower and what you're saying i i guess is that this is not working right? We've not evolved to exercise. We, we're, we're now living in a society where we simply don't have to anymore. That necessity has gone. So you need to find a way to make it necessary. And the way you found of doing it is you're meeting someone. So if your buddy has gone to the trouble of getting up early in the morning and goes to your agreed spot and you don't show up, there is a bit of, you know, you have social pressure to show up, which is why so many movement programs talk about you know doing it with other people with all our clinical experience between us we're saying that compassion is one of the most important things we can do now for people who are skeptical of that how would you convince them so i think there are four good reasons as to why compassion is a good idea um the first is that uh when you look at the evidence of the, what happens from the positive side of compassion, the evidence is really profound. And, and compassion is the basis of social relationships. And there are numerous studies out there which, which show that social rela relationships have a profound impact on health. And in particular, there's uh, one that I always quote by uh, Julianne holt Lundstad, um, and it's the impact of social relationships on, mort on mortality. And uh, good social relationships 
are more powerful than pretty much any other intervention we have, including giving up smoking, drinking, diet, exercise, what, whatever else you care to mention, uh, helping us live longer. And that's more than just a nice thing. That's because it's, it, it's embedded in our, our biochemistry and our biology. The second, the second reason is when you look at the impact of loneliness, and uh, loneliness uh, um, has a uh, increases your chances of dying early by about thirty percent, and um, and I know you you uh, had a podcast with Vivek Murthy, and he wrote a book about all of that with yeah. loads of evidence in it. The third reason is that when you look at uh, the presence of um, hormones like oxytocin and oxytocin receptors, you find them throughout the animal kingdom. Uh, and human beings are the most social of animals. Now, the presence of oxytocin and oxytocin receptors, which is the hormone that is associated with compassion, the so-called socializing hormone, its mere presence means that it has an evolutionary advantage. It couldn't possibly be there without it helping us. And uh, And what that means is that actually we survived through being compassionate and being kind. That survival of the fittest, interestingly, was a term uh, that was invented by Herbert Spencer, not Charles Darwin. And um, he started uh, social Darwinism, with, uh, which has got loads of implications which are not so great. But in fact, Darwin wrote a book on uh, the impact of emotions in man and animals so that you, we can look from a from an evolutionary perspective and call it survival of the kindest rather than survival of the fittest we didn't get through the ice age by by beating our chests and killing each other actually there's plenty of evidence which showed that we helped each other out people with with significant disabilities that they got in childhood living to old age and then finally, uh, I think a, a, a piece of evidence that helps because it's measurable, we can look at the outcomes of what happened in the Compassionate Community Program that happened in Froome, where we saw emergency admissions drop by 30% at a time where they were increasing everywhere else. And there are no interventions ever which have reduced population emergency admissions. I've got one other thing to add that I forgot, and that's the Harvard and Gluex studies of adult development, um, which, in which uh, studies began in 1938 in Harvard looking at um, what happened to people through measuring year on year and re-interviewing and looking at the outcomes. And, and the fourth leader of the study, um, because it's gone on for so many years, says it's, it's if you want to lead a happy, healthy, long life, it's all about relationships. And the basis of relationships is compassion. And, and so if you're thinking about why is compassion more than a good idea, uh, it's because it has a profound impact on everything we do and everything we touch. And even from a personal perspective, if you want to be healthy and happy, be compassionate. Yeah, you can actually have, well, can you have a selfish reason for being compassionate? Like if we, if we, if we look at this individual, individualistic culture, that, that many of us are falling prey to these days, this idea that, oh, if I'm kind to someone else, it's good for me. Right? Is that a good enough reason to be kind and compassionate? Or does your kindness and compassion have to be with no strings attached? So it's best if there are no strings attached, but it has to start somewhere. And, um, and I think that it, it makes sense to be compassionate but sometimes making sense isn't enough. You know, that we, we tend to think that, that we make decisions based on reasoning. But it's much more than reasoning. Our decisions are based on, on emotion and inspiration as well. So that if you, if you think about the three things together, the, the reasoning, the emotion, uh, the emotion being this feels right, and the inspiration being... I'm so inspired by what you do. I'm going to do that as well. 
that they all come together at the same time. And, and so not only can you reason that compassion is a good idea, you can know it and feel inspired by it as well. And, and hopefully, you know, not only are we social animals, we have the capacity to choose. Hopefully, we provide a really good case for being more compassionate. Yeah. You know, as you were saying that, it, it reminded me of when I used to work in Oldham, right in the center of Oldham, a pretty, you know, what would be called from the data a deprived community, low socioeconomic status. And, you know, I used to get up back then, I think this is pre kids or maybe when my son was very young. I'd, I'd want to get to work by about 7.15 or so, just cause to get through the blood results before I started seeing patients at eight o'clock. And I used to also love missing traffic. And I'd stop off on the way, uh, just in my my town at you know a local cafe that was open. I'd, I'd stop off, I'd get myself a coffee. And initially I'd be getting it, I think as a takeaway, but you know what, you'd start to talk to people. So I was there 6.30, along with my fellow caffeine addicts. And, you know, we'd sit there and chat. And you end up, you know, I didn't know them, uh, apart from through the coffee shop, I didn't have their phone number, their text number, but we built up a bit of a rapport and a bit of a, you know, a 6.30 a.m. club, like a community where you'd you'd actually really look forward to seeing them and go, oh, you know, how was that yesterday? And I, I'm sure that changed how my day went down, even though if I may not get home till 8pm that night, that little dose of compassion and connection, I think would get me through some very stressful days as a GP. Yeah, I mean, it's heartening, isn't it? It's heartwarming. Those moments, even those, those light moments where you have a gentle chat with someone, they're heartwarming. We feel it and it sustains us. And, and what's great is that that sense of heartwarming is not just with you, but it's everyone involved in it. Yeah. And, and you start to gather there because you know you're going to meet some friendly people. That's a great story. Yeah, it's just, and, and I'm sure people listening to this or watching it on YouTube will also if they think about it in their own life, they'll, they'll know there's little moments. And I've heard you speak. I heard your TED talk, which is brilliant. I really hope people at the end of this go and listen to it. It's uh, it's uh, it, it really is wonderful. And I think some of that data you just went through, you presented, didn't you? I remember when that slide came up. Um, what was it? It was it was which interventions have the most impact on was it on longevity or your reduced risk of getting ill? So on the technical side of it it's the odds ratio of mortality and and that's uh, what does that means, mean for people who don't understand yeah, that exactly that means what are your chances of dying with the different types of intervention of dying prematurely and obviously um that uh if you give up smoking, you reduce your risk of dying significantly, but not as much as social relationships. And it, likewise with diet and exercise. And the one that, that tickles me the most is the, the, blood, the drug treatment of high blood pressure because, um, because high, the impact of treating high blood pressure on your risk of dying prematurely is dwarfed by the impact of social relationships uh, and uh, and by the way uh, as you and i both know if you have good social relationships you know that's your oxytocin spinning around your body your blood pressure drops so <laughs> maybe you don't even need the treatment so much i think the first three like there's a graph on there and you, you plot it out beautifully and the top three things were all related to relationships, social relationships. Yeah. And drug treatment of high blood pressure was right. You know, it, it has an impact, but it was dwarfed compared to that. And for people listening to this, if there's any healthcare professional, or I know a lot of medical students and junior doctors also listen, guys, you know how hammered home it is that, you know, properly treating blood pressure will have an impact on reduced heart attacks, reduced strokes, et cetera, et cetera. What Julian is saying is based upon the data your social relationships, the impact that will have dwarfs the impact of drug treatment of high blood pressure. So I don't think any of us are saying don't treat high blood pressure, but I think we're just trying to elevate the importance of compassion and relationships basically to the very, very top of the pyramid, right? That's it. And, and something uh, I've come to realize recently is that uh, 
that actually the treatment of high blood pressure is quite a good model for bringing compassion and social relationships into the therapeutic environment. Because if you think about it, if you're treating high blood pressure, what you're doing is the first thing is you're screening, you're identifying people who, who have got high blood pressure. So you, you measure everyone's blood pressure. And when you find it elevated, you prescribe a treatment. And then you follow up with the treatment to see whether the blood pressure has come down or not, and you alter the, the treatment until you get the required response. Well, why not take that same model with social about social relationships into your routine clinical practice? So what about making a routine assessment of your patients about what their social relationships are, and then think about what you can do about that in, in, within the consultation, because it's more effective than most of the medicines we use. So why not bring it in as a matter of routine? And, and, and we know from Froome that the results of when you do that is absolutely transformational. Well, well, let's go into Froome, right? Because what happened in Froome is remarkable. A lot of people listening to this probably won't be familiar with what happened there. So maybe you could paint the picture for us. What was going on in Froome before? What did you and colleagues introduce and what was the profound impact that you saw? Okay, so uh, Froome is a market town in Somerset, which is a county in the southwest of England. Um, it's a town of 28,000 people in a, uh, a county of 500,000 people. And it's, it's always had something of uh, an independent streak about it going back through the years. And, and even the last two election cycles has had uh, independent town councillors. There are no political party members who, who make up the town council. And um, at, at one point, a number of the local GP practices combined together. And there's a, an incredibly good natured, sensible, clear thinking GP called Dr. Helen Kingston. And, and she wanted to uh, try and find a way of uh, having moved to a large practice of making sure that the that care was coordinated, that there was good exchange of information between the practice members. And at the same time, uh, she understood that so much of what we do as doctors is not related to drug treatment and wanted people to feel supported by their community. So what she did is that she, she employed Jenny Hartnell, who's a uh, uh, got a background in community development. And Jenny started a community development program in the town of Froome, but from within the medical center. And then she combined the two. And, and we can go into more detail if we have time about what the community de development involved. But needless to say, it was really about bringing the community together and making use of the incredible wealth of resources that are present in every community. And then if people are feeling lonely or isolated, which is very, very common and, not, and is worse in illness, in fact, then there's a way of connecting that community resource to what happens inside the medical practice. So I'll, I'll give you an example to, to demonstrate it. And, and I talk about this in the book. There's a, uh, a lady called Kathy who, who was a businesswoman who got um, uh, a very severe form of acute rheumatoid arthritis. And she lived in Froome. She lives in Froome and she's got a, a, a dog, which is really important to her because she walks a dog first thing in the morning and she's got two children and she didn't really know the people around her that, that well. And the rheumatoid arthritis actually put her in a wheelchair within the space of three weeks and her, her whole life was devastated. So she went to the doctor and said, look, I need a sense of hope that this isn't my life from now on. And so, and so the doctor said, uh, okay, look, I'm going to get you to see a health connector. A health connector is somebody who uh, is trained in motivational interviewing, but is not a health professional. And so Rose, a health connector, went to see Kathy and, and, um, and said, what do you want? And Kathy said, I need to meet some other people who are going through this because I need to know that I'm not stuck. And Rose said, I got just a thing. And so Kathy goes off, first of all, to the uh, self-management group for people with chronic disease that's in the medical center. And then she goes from the self-management to the pain management to the exercise. 
out into the community. And then she's connected to this incredible wealth of people of all the stuff that's going on in the community, whether it's talking cafes, which is what you had down your coffee shop, or whether it's a knitting group or an art group or a healthy walking group or whatever it is. And and Kathy makes this journey from... Um, from being somebody who was relatively isolated and focused to being somebody who is deeply engaged in the community. And she describes the outcome of it about how she has got friends for life. And she knows that they are there for her and she is there for them. And and her life is transformed. Not only does she regain her health, she regains her happiness. And that the, the combination of the, the medical treatment of her disease with this wealth of support transforms her life. When, when you say she regains her health, right? So she gets tapped into that when she's been diagnosed. And I think you said she's in a wheelchair. So when you say she's regained her health, what, what happens? I mean, what, what, what does she get to? What's her pain like? What's her mobility like? So she, she, her pain and her mobility improve. And obviously some of that is related to um, treatment of her disease. But her well-being improves. Her sense of social connectedness, her sense of, excuse me, who's around her, who her friends are, her joy in life, her reason for living, everything is transformed. And and so it's a a personal journey of of increasing health and well-being and transformation. What's interesting, Julian, for me, as you described her improvements there, is that we started off talking about pain and mobility. And of course, the medical treatment may have helped that. But I, I also have seen enough to know that actually, it could also be a lot of the other stuff as well. The feeling of connectedness can can absolutely reduce pain in my experience. But you said at the end, her, you know, her joy in living, her love for life, that all that sort of stuff, the kind of softer stuff that often in, in medicine, we don't measure. But in many ways, that's the most important part of being alive, the most important part of being a human being on planet Earth is how much fulfillment, how much joy do we get day to day? Whereas I really feel that medicine has, possibly without realizing it, become very reductive and we measure blood tests and we do pain scores. Now, of course, reducing pain is really important and can improve people's quality in life. But I think we've overvalued a lot of those, um, I guess, more objective parameters at the expense of potentially some of these subjective ones? Uh, I mean, I, you know, obviously I agree with you. And and my clinical background is that of a palliative care physician. So um, pain is something I'm... So for those who don't know what palliative care is, I looked after people with terminal illnesses. Mostly cancer, but it applies to any kind of illness. And, um, uh, and of course, you know, pain is a significant significant part of it. But when when you're treating people in pain day to day, their mental state is is has a profound impact on their sensation of pain. And if you just use medication to try and control their pain, you're you're never going to get completely on top of it. But if you start to deal with what matters most in life and and what matters most is so often the people we know and love in the places we know and love. You know, that if you start to work with all of that, then a similar kind of transformation that happened to Kathy can take place. And of course, if people are feeling loved and secure, then their anxiety goes down, their pain levels go down. And actually, you know, then you start producing all the things that we naturally produce as human beings, including oxytocin and our, our uh, endorphins, which are the, the morphine type compounds that we naturally produce inside us. Yeah, I mean, I can't get that out of my head that your biochemistry, your biology, your physiology changes when you have close social connections, when you're compassionate to someone else or they're compassionate to you. It matters so much. And I think, you know, as I said to you in the kitchen just beforehand, you know, I, I, I sort of get sent so many books these days and I, often I don't even get to look at them, what's in them. But there's something about yours that just, 
lit lit me up inside. You know, the Compassion Project, a case for hope and human kindness from the town that beat loneliness. I was just right. I'm straight in. You know, I I just couldn't stop reading it. It's 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 it really is where personal, professional, all of my interests basically collide on this topic. It's something I think a lot about, particularly as my public profile has grown and I communicate a lot on social media with people. And I, I want to talk to you about social media uh, because I understand that apart from a, a, a minimally used Twitter account, I'm not entirely sure you do much, which is possibly why you look so happy, well fit, uh, despite having worked for over 40 years as a doctor. Um, but I, I very much always lead with compassion. And that means you won't get as much growth as other people who don't, but because you won't, because it, you can, if you go divisive and you go with sort of toxic kind of messaging, you get all the engagement, you get all the sort of, you attract that kind of, um, you, you attract those kind of responses as well. You really trigger people. And I want to be part of the solution. I want to, I want to try and you know, as, as Gandhi says, be the change that you want to see in the world, right? So there's a lot out there that we feel we can't change, we can't control. But I guess we can all control whether we choose compassion or not, can't we? I, 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 exactly. And and I think you're doing a great job. And and I think when we we look around us that we can put our compassionate spectacles on and and see whether there's the presence or absence of compassion and and so often when you look at at what happens in social media or what happens in the media in general or if we're hearing about politics or business or environment and and we've got our compassion glasses on we see that it's absent and and it's heartbreaking to see and so that what I hope is that that actually we provide a, a really good argument to say this is down to us as individuals, that that within our life we can choose to be more compassionate. In, in any given situ situation we're in, whether we're at home dealing with the kids or down the shops or in our workplace, actually at any moment we have the choice to be compassionate or not and if we choose compassion not only is it good for us it's good for everyone around us uh, and so it, in a way the heart of all of this is down to an individual level it's about each person and uh, every person choosing to be just a little bit more compassionate because i guarantee that once you start you'll never stop why does this matter so much to you? Is this something that you felt as a kid, as a teenager, or was it your experience as a palliative care doctor, you know, seeing people towards the end of their life? You know, what was it or was it a combination? So it's interesting that you say that and it, it's something that, that I've thought about a lot and I can remember it being important as a child, you, like wanting the world to be a better place and, and, and actually... Most kids are like that. Actually, the uh, children have got a good sense of what's fair and what isn't fair. And, and I somehow uh, clung on to that. I don't know why. And, and that was my motivation, as it is for, for I think, everyone who goes into uh, anything to do with healthcare, yeah. is that they have this, this basic motivation to try and do good, to try and help. Um, and what I found was that that it was central to what I felt was most helpful. And uh, it, so when I went into medical school, it was, it was back in the day, you know, and, um, and um, it was the time of uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher, funnily enough, and uh, that point where the health service re really starts to get constricted and disinvestment. And, and health service at that time was extremely hierarchical. And, uh, you know, the doctors were these kind of uh, magical figures and, and it, it felt very uncomfortable to me. And yeah. uh, I took a diversion uh, away from medicine for a few years to study acupuncture uh, and osteopathy, particularly because um, they seem to embody somehow uh, a greater sense of this compassion and working with people and all of the complexity of people. 
but I also felt like there was something valuable in there and and I got drawn into palliative care which is a place where where that compassion is particularly strong and vivid uh, so for, for whatever reason it's always been with me and and I found it's it's carried me through and led me into you know uh, these the outcomes of Froome were totally unexpected but the reason for doing it was to give people the best treatment and 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 so it's a kind of fortunate circumstances where what's interesting about Froome is that there are some really tangible measurable improvements which are groundbreaking through the application of compassion on a population based level have you had interest because what was what was done in Froome is remarkable i remember at the first or second prescribing lifestyle medicine course that, that I and one of my colleagues, Dr. Panja, teaches uh, to doctors and other healthcare professionals about how to personalize the lifestyle interventions for their patients, not only as prevention, but also as part of the treatment. And we put up a slide actually from one of the first Guardian articles, I think, that actually spoke about the work in Froome, which we thought it was just incredible to showcase that to doctors. Um, but, you know, it would seem it was so groundbreaking. You would almost make the con draw the conclusion that everyone should be knocking on your door, going, "Well, look, we want those results in our village, in our town, whether that's in the UK or beyond." So, what kind of interest and what kind of knocking on the doors have you had? Well, a lot. And from from that article, which was written by George Monbiot in the Guardian. We got worldwide interest, and um, literally from every continent, we had people ringing us up saying, "Tell us about it." And it takes time for things to get off the ground, um, and and the pandemic hasn't helped. Uh, but we've got interest from all over the world where people are, are starting these kind of projects. Um, in particular, um, there's a lot of interest in Australia and New Zealand, and. Um, Scandinavia, as, as you might imagine, they're uh, quite sensitive to all of this. And uh, there are projects starting in, in Colombia and the US. So uh, there's a lot of interest. We have, we have projects running in Wales. Uh, that, that one article, amazingly, had a, uh, generated a huge amount of interest. Yeah, it's unsurprising, really, because what you're offering is reduced hospital admissions, reduced emergency attendances, you know, improved quality of life scores, uh, reducing healthcare costs, basically, but at the same time, improving outcomes, which seems to be the holy grail for any healthcare system around the world. But, but what's fascinating is the way you're doing it, it's almost the opposite of how medicine and how society has gone really. And, and I, I know I keep making this point, but I think about it a lot. So everything's quite reductive now. Medicine, I feel for all its benefits, some of the, I think, unintended consequences of super specialism is that we, we reduce everything down to this blood test or this body part. We don't see the connections. It's all very individualistic, right? I'm gonna see you and give you your plan. And I get that and I see the merit in that. But it strikes me as that what you're offering is, it's almost the complete opposite. It's almost saying there's too much pressure on you as an individual to sort your own health out. Let's get you in a switched on community where you can talk about it, where you can actually connect and foster these loving, um, intimate relationships and it strikes me that you're sort of saying by doing that, by putting the focus on community rather than the individual, actually individual health improves, right? It's, it's where we putting the focus. I think that I think that's right. I mean, uh, you, you know, you can think about a number of ways in which that's expressed. So, so you can think about things like the men's shed and the women's shed, and and you don't need to be ill to go down the men's shed. You know, it's something you can join in, and and if you like, it's a love, laughter, and friendship that happens along the way. What, what is the men's shed? So for the people men's, who don't know. Yeah. Okay. So the men's shed is. Uh, 
Uh, it's a, it, in fact a, a national association, and it's where men can go because men like building things. <laughs> and uh, uh, I've got that weakness as well. I'm forever down the builder's yard, you know, picking up bits of wood. Uh, but but of course, people have a lifetime of experience, and 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 so people like to share and pass that experience on. But it's also a place where people can get on and do stuff and make things and and find that love and laughter on the way. And and what happens is is trans- transformational in those moments so um one guy for example um talks about how um he he had a a stroke and he was really angry afterwards kind of active guy and then his wife leaves him and he's at rock bottom and he goes down the men's shed uh, just for something to do and and he makes friends there and he says you know and tears up as he's saying it he says well uh, whenever I ask somebody to, so to have a cup of tea or something like that, they never say no. And he says, I never thought I'd have friends like that again. And that's not because somebody is ill. That's just the daily life. Anyone can join in. And that keeps you healthy, keeps you out of hospital, keeps you sane. But then if you think about you have a um, physical or or some kind of mental illness, and you think that if you can you can bring in that community support. Uh, it makes a huge difference. And and just to give you an example, you know, you think about something like diabetes and what 5% of our population have got uh, maturity onset diabetes and uh, a further 5% are pre-diabetic. They're at risk of developing diabetes. Well, so that's so much to do with lifestyle. And it's all very well for a doctor to say, uh, actually, you've got to cut down your carbohydrates, stop eating sugar. and uh, But what on earth does that mean to somebody who might not know how to cook properly, might not have a shop nearby, may feel overwhelmed by the price of food, and who may feel lonely and isolated because they've got this disease and what do they do now? Well, if you start thinking about how you can add in community resource to that, then you can start thinking about, well, what about other people who are in the same situation? And and what about if they figured out what to cook, how to cook? If you're, if you're a, a, a widower and you never did the cooking, what on earth do you do? And where do you buy the food from? And how do you buy fresh food that's cheap? And if you do it together, is it easier? And what about if you start cooking for each other? Yeah. And, and then you start building these relationships. And not only do you lead a healthier lifestyle, you get all the benefits that we've been talking about that happen with your biochemistry and your physiology and everything from from the love and laughter that you develop with the people around you. If you enjoyed that conversation, I think you are going to love the one that I had with Professor Tim Spector, all about food. It's right there. So give it a click and let me know what you think. If you snack a couple of hours before a meal, your metabolic response to that meal is poorer than if you didn't snack. Okay, just say that again, because I think that's really important.